All right, guys, I want to thank you guys for coming. Um, today, I'm, well, obviously, first let me introduce myself. My name is Josh Jorgensen. I'm the producer of Black Tip H. I've been shark fishing since, I was two, uh, since 2003. I've been fishing since I was three years old, and I've fished throughout the Great Lakes, Bahamas, all through Florida. I fished in Massachusetts, New Jersey here, so had a, been able to move around a little bit, but I'm very thankful, and i um, glad you guys are here. I hope you guys uh, have been able to watch some of our videos and have learned from them. Uh, today, the topics I'm going over, I'm going to go over land-based shark fishing, offshore shark fishing, and how to use heavy drag. You see in our videos, we, we use up to 120 pounds of drag. So I'm gonna teach you guys how to do that today so you guys can catch enormous fish. The first thing I'm gonna start off with is basic shark fishing techniques to improve your chances of catching sharks. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is your bait. You know, making sure you have the right bait and the right size is very important. So first thing you wanna do is whenever you travel somewhere or if you're in a local area, you wanna make sure that you know what is actually legal to use for bait. Uh, some places, and for example, in Florida, we can use certain species that you can't use for bait in other states like Texas. So you definitely wanna make sure you don't run into any legal problems with that. The next thing I wanna talk about is my favorite kind of bait to use. So I like bonitas, or you guys call them false abacore. In Florida, everyone calls them bonita. Um, tunas, stingrays, jacks, and uh, anything in the mackerel family. Oily, bloody fish is really good bait. Um, try to avoid using like snappers and groupers and stuff like that. But at the same time, uh, I will say this, my biggest fish I ever caught, 13 foot four inch tiger shark, was caught on a yellowtail snapper this big. We had uh, 20 pound bonitas and this, this shark would not touch him because it is what he was feeding on. He was eating the snappers off the reef and that's what he wanted. So sometimes you need to make exceptions based on what the fish are actually feeding on. You know. If you brought bluefin tuna down from here and brought it to Florida, you probably wouldn't catch anything because there's no bluefin tuna in Florida and that doesn't really relate to the sharks down there. Same thing if you brought fish from Florida and brought it up here. So you want to match everything according to your environment. Um, so let's talk about your bait size. So when I'm surf fishing and I'm casting baits, I don't like to use a bait any bigger than a closed fist. One reason is you could break your rod if you're using too heavy of a bait. And the other reason is you could lose a lot of fish because they can't physically put the bait in their mouth. So when, I'm not, when the bite's not good, I will use, um, I use a bait the size of my fist, just to, you know, so like, cause there's little fish out there, crabs and little fish that peck at the bait. So you wanna make sure your bait lasts long enough so it can, you can soak long enough to actually hook a fish. But if the bite's really good, you don't wanna use anything bigger than a credit card. That's the size of a bait you wanna use. You're gonna hook up, your hookup ratios will increase by like 50%. That's my favorite size bait when I fish for black tips and other sharks from the beach. When you're on the boat and you're fishing big sharks or if you're, you're land-based shark fishing and you're kayaking out 130s and 80 whites, um, you can use pretty much whatever size you want. Um, obviously, if you're catching 1,000-pound makers, you could feed it a 100-pound uh, yellowfin, no problem, right? But you also want to make sure that you don't use a bait too big that the shark physically can't eat it or he may only eat part of it. Sharks can get pretty picky. So, I mean, some, most people don't think that, but... I've had times where it gets incredibly frustrating that they won't eat. So, you know, if you can, I'll give, actually, I'll give, give you an example story. I was on a, on, on a trip um, two months ago and we had this 12 foot hand rag come right to the boat. And we had this bonita, I was, you know, trying to just create a chump slick. And this hammerhead, I, I took another bonita and I filleted the whole side, you know, a nice fillet like this. I threw it in the water. He wanted nothing to do with it. He zeroed in on that, that bonita. And this thing was so aggressive you know, his head was this wide. He was sticking his head completely out of the water when I lifted the bonita so he wouldn't eat it. And he would, st he'd, he'd stick his head two feet out of the water trying to eat that bonita. When I threw that bonita on the, uh, the one that he was after, he, he ate it in a second. But the other bonita I threw out there, he wouldn't even touch it. So sometimes if they zero in on, on something, that's all they want. And sometimes you have to sacrifice something to give it to them. Um, when I'm kayaking baits from the shore, I, I tend not to like to use baits bigger than a piece of eight and a half by 11 paper, just because you could miss a lot of fish. Like if you use huge baits, you know, if you're trying to catch bull sharks or sandbars or whatever, or duskies, you know, they, they don't really have really big mouths, you know? I mean, they, they, they can definitely eat, eat a whole bonita, but they're gonna sit there and chew on it for a while. So using a smaller bait will definitely increase your odds. At the same time, the big, if you guys have probably seen this video, the giant shark defeats two experienced fishermen, which was the biggest fish I've ever hooked in my life. And, terrified me from hooking a fish that size again. Um, that was a 40 inch cobia I used for bait. That was a huge bait. 
and that thing ate it like it was a snack. So, and I will tell you this, I'm 99% sure that was a great white. It was not a hammerhead or a tiger. So that was, that was the most insane thing ever. But normally that doesn't, uh, we, have, we had a YouTube collaboration. We were working with the guys, you might, some of you may know them, they're called Hushin. And um, I got a 47 pound cobia head I put out and we had a hammerhead playing with it for about an hour. He tried eating it and he couldn't, you know? So, and he, we had two cobias out. He could have gone to the smaller cobia, but he, o he only wanted that big head. And when we brought, after an hour of trying to set the hook on this fish, when he tried to eat it, he, we brought the bait back in. There were teeth marks everywhere, but where the, where the hook was in the front of the mouth. So he was trying to get it, he couldn't physically fit it in his mouth. So that's where, you know, you may want to get a really big shark, but it all, you, may, you may not catch anything as well. You know, so sometimes it's better to use a smaller bait. Um, so going back to know what kind of bait to use, going back to what I was talking about before, black tips, for example. I've been fishing for black tips since 2003, and I thought I knew them pretty well until this year when I got baffled. Uh, for example, last year with Dude Perfect, we filmed a show with them, and we caught 19 sharks in 24 hours. This year, I caught 12 sharks the entire year. You know, and the sharks were there. They're, they were swimming around and happy, and they just weren't biting. We, we were, I was throwing live jacks like this, and they'd come up and they'd, they'd hit it like, a, like they'd bump it like a porpoise or a dolphin. They, they'd, they'd play with the bait. They wouldn't even actually eat it. They were feeding on something I didn't have. I don't know what they were feeding on. They might have been feeding on thread fins. They might have been fe feeding on sardines. But they were feeding on a bait that I w didn't, w couldn't, couldn't get. I tried everything. Spanish mackerel, bluefish, jacks. They would not hit. So you always want to make sure you match, like going back, matching your bait with what they're feeding on. Observe, be very observant of what's going on around you. You know, sharks are always following a food source. So if they're, when a black tip's feeding on a bluefish, that's all they're gonna, that's all you're gonna catch them on is a bluefish. If you try using a Jack Laval or a Bonita, they're not gonna touch it. So you always wanna match your bait. And um, one reason I always bring a bait rod with me wherever I go to make sure that I'm, you know, like you could be the most prepared. You could come out there with the best bait, you know, out here you come out with, you know, yellowfin tuna heads, big eye tuna heads, blue, bluefin tuna heads. You have a variety of good bait. You're going out to fish and make out the shark charmer or some of that. And he may not be wanting any of that. He might be feeding on trigger fish. You know, that sounds crazy, but they do that. That's all they want. So always bring extra rods to catch bait. Don't just, you know, lock in for sharks. Um, I don't know how many of you guys use circle hooks. Um, that's all I use. I used to use J hooks a lot. And one thing that happens with J hooks, forget the gut hooking. I mean, you, that's one big problem, but you actually like on a mako or a black tip sharks that jump, you'll, you'll lose a lot more fish. They're gonna, they'll just spit it when they, when they get that certain angle that J hook just comes right out of their mouth. So you want a circle hook. If you get a good hook set in there, it's very hard for it to get a, uh, come out if you keep that line tight. So I highly recommend always using circle hooks. We're gonna save questions to the end. Um, I got a whole bunch of stuff to go through here and I'll, I'll get derailed. Um, so <laughs> catch, catch and release. Um, I'm all about catch and release. And one thing, you know, I always tell people is 50% of actually catching the fish is, is burning it, la landing it. The other 50% is releasing it. You know, we've had times we've caught huge sharks and they died and it just felt like like no one was happy at, at that moment when we saw this 12, 13 foot fish that was dead. You know, it was just like, wow, that sucks. So even though you caught this enormous fish, fish of a lifetime, the fact that it died means that you, you lost. You know, the fish didn't live. You didn't, you, weren't, you didn't have a successful release. So it's always, I always tell people this, always avoid using light tackle for shark fishing. You, it's more fun, it can be, but you're gonna kill a lot more fish with light tackle. Sharks, like, all, like most fish, they can only fight for so long. You know, I've had battles go two and a half hours plus, and that, you know, I fought, I fought one for almost three hours, and that shark died. I was in 500 feet of water, and it was sitting on the bottom, and I couldn't lift it up. So, and that was, on, that was hooked on a sailfish rod. So I fought it for three hours, and it ended up being on the bottom of the ocean. So um, you definitely want to make sure you use the right tackle for the sharks you're targeting. If you're targeting huge sharks, use 130s. Don't even waste time with anything else. If you're targeting sharks that are around 500 pounds, I wouldn't even use anything less than an 80 wide. You know, you always want to make sure that you are fully prepared and you use really strong line. I always, I always use line that's three times stronger than the drag I'm using. Because if you get down to your third spool, that your, um, your drag and your reel is much, much higher. 
And um, when it comes to removing the hook, a lot, you know, I've, I've, I've seen this, I've done this, you know, we use these expensive hooks, like these, these are five bucks a piece, and sometimes, you know, you use those ownership removers, you're gonna spend, what, 10, $12 a hook, right? So you don't wanna lose your hook. But if you try to take the hook out for too long, like if you spend five minutes doing that, the shark's gonna die. You know, they've, I've seen it happen, I've, you know, they just, they can't be on their side for that long, they can't be without movement for so long, they need to have water flushing through their gills, so, that's why in a lot of my videos you'll see us using bolt cutters. I don't even try to take hooks out anymore on big sharks. I just cut the hook and let it go. And when you cut the hook, you will, you know, by cutting the hook in half, you allow it to slide out eventually. You know, if you can't get it out then, you it will eventually come out. And one thing I learned from my, my diving friends that, you know, in Florida there's a lot of shark dives. Sharks actually get flesh-eating bacteria from hooks. So you'll see some sharks, their entire face rots off. So it's really important to remove the hooks. And I'll tell you this straight up, hooks don't rust out. They don't, it's, the, it's a big myth. When um, I caught a Jack Caval once, and it had a, I took a picture of it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post it up. It had a 16 knot mustad circle hook in it. The barnacles on the hook were like this big. When I took it out of the Jack, the piece of the hook that was in the flesh had absolutely zero corrosion because the, the fish's physical body sealed it up so it couldn't corrode. So that, that, that piece of steel was in there forever. It never would come out. So always try to remove the hooks. That's why, and if you can't remove the hook, just bring a pair of bolt cutters, cut them, you know? And, if, and it's not just sharks, do that with all fish. It's not just sharks get that, that, that flesh-eating bacteria. All fish will get that. So super <coughs> important. Next thing, sharp hooks. Guys, I can't tell you how many sharks I've lost because I, I was too lazy to sharpen my hooks. So make sure your hooks are as sharp as possible, you know? Especially when you get a really big shark and you have a, you have a a huge hook like this, you want to make sure that you, you know that, that penetrates all the way through. And a lot of times, you know, you know, you guys, I don't know if you guys do makos and that, but sometimes you guys you have to use the boat to set the hook. You can't you can't just set it with, you know, just the, the stretch of the mono may, may not get it tight enough. On the beach, when we have 400 yards of line out, you'll you might have seen this in some of our videos. We actually will run up the beach as fast as we can. We're real tight, and we'll run in the opposite direction until that mono gets tight, because you know, there's so much stretch. You have 400 yards of line out. You have, that's an elastic band. You gotta get tight. And if you don't get tight right away, the hook just falls right out of his mouth. So that's really important. Um, even hooks like Supermodus and Gamakatsus and, and la uh, Trocar lasers, they get dull. You always gotta always keep a file on you. Even though they're, they come out of the box super sharp, you use them once, or even if you didn't catch a fish, they do, there's a little bit of corrosion on there, they will get dull. So make sure you always touch them up. Um, Next thing, I get, I get a lot of questions about when to set the hook. A lot of people, they don't, they don't feel comfortable when to set the hook. So every shark feeds differently, right? So like a hammerhead, for example, is the hardest <coughs> shark, in my opinion, to, I think, to hook because they have a very weird shaped head. The leader can get tangled around their tee and they eat, they have a very small mouth. So it takes, it takes some time to eat it. And a lot of times they just sit there and play with it. So you always wanna make sure that you give the shark enough time and this is something you, you really can't put a, an equation on this. You know, can you do it for, you do it 20 seconds, is it 30 seconds? You just gotta evaluate the size of your bait you have versus the shark you're trying to hook. So if I'm trying to hook a, a, t a, a thousand pound mako and I'm throwing a, a 10 pound skipjack tuna, I'll eat that in one second, right? But if you're, tr if you're throwing a much bigger bait, you know, to a smaller shark, like a 300 pound blue shark or something, then he's not gonna eat it as fast, right? So you wanna make sure that you give it enough time for that bait. And if it's a really, really big bait, he may, ha he may have to chomp on it for a good minute. But a good thing, that's a good thing when you use circle hooks, you're not gonna, most of the time you don't gut hook them. I mean, circle hooks still gut hook fish, but it's like 99% of the time it doesn't. So let me ask you a question here, guys. Raise your hands. How many people shark fish from the beach here? Awesome, awesome. So we're gonna go over some shark fishing stuff right now from the beach. Um, we're gonna talk about gear first. So when I fish for sharks under five feet, like black tips or black nose or whatever, you know, surf fishing tackle, like, like uh, this one right here, this, this little saltiga, it's one of our combos on Tackle Direct. Uh, that's, that's plenty, you don't need, you need a, a minimum of 300 yards of line. Um, you know, have a lot of fun with them. You know, a, f a five foot shark's not gonna weigh any more than 60 pounds. Um, when you start going to sharks between five and eight feet, you're gonna wanna use a 50 wide, like that accurate right there, or you're gonna wanna use a really serious spinning reel like this dogfight or that Stella, you know, that has good heavy drag and a good amount of line capacity. I recommend a minimum of 500 yards of line, you know. Um, 
I can't tell you I've, I've hooked how many big sharks I've hooked on my, on my surf gear and you just, you know, you don't have the line. Like, even a, a big black tip, I've hooked some 160, 170 pound black tips and within 30 seconds, they'll take 400 yards of line. Can't stop them with, with heavy drag. So um, it's really important to have really, you know, a, a reel that can output a lot of drag and has a lot of line capacity. For bigger sharks between eight and 12 feet, I would use an 80 wide like that Avid right there um, or Shimano or whatever, a any 80 wide is pretty much good. You wanna get a minimum of a seven to 800 yards of line on there. And if you're fishing for sharks over 12 feet, you know, big hammers, tigers, makos, whatever, I just go 130. Um, there's just, you don't know what you're gonna hook. I mean, I've hooked fish so big. I, I mean, I had um, one fish I hooked uh, on an Ali Techno 7080, which is like a basically a 70 size. This fish was running so fast, the entire reel components were shaking. It was moving so fast, and that was just heavy drag. Um, so when you hook a really, really big fish on a small reel, you're, you're gonna get burned fast. I've seen 50 whites get spooled in less than a minute from the beach. So if you hook a big hammer in Florida, it takes no time at all. That fish is moving 20, 30 miles an hour, you know, with, with you know, because it doesn't have a 50 wide only for outputs. Maybe, you know, unless you're using like a, maybe an Accurate or a Kyra or, or a T-Rex Avid, you're probably gonna get 30 pounds of drag. And a, a big hammer can spool that in like, like 45 seconds. It's insane. When you see it, you won't believe it. Um, how to find sharks on the beach. That's just something that, you know, is, 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 is hard to do. First thing you always wanna do is make sure you check your local laws because some states and some places don't like shark fishing from the beach. So always make sure that it's legal. Um, sharks love structure and they like, find, they like structure that holds bait. One of my, my go-to spots when I go shark fishing from the beach is to find inlets or waterways where you know bait's gonna congregate. Um, that's really important. Always look for artificial reef programs or any kind of structure, uh, reefs, <coughs> sandbars, inlets, tide erosion, uh, rips, currents, whatever, whatever you got drop-offs, anywhere where you think bait's gonna congregate. Shark. Coming from the beach, let's talk about that for a sec. First off, I've tried it, it does not work. So if you think it's gonna work, you can drop 100 pounds of chum out there. I'll, if you guys have heard of my term, the black tip challenge, um, and actually um, this, is my, uh, this was my last year running, I'm, I'm no longer gonna run that tournament, but um, we've had days where there was like 100, ang 100 rods out on a one beach with fresh, amazing baits and not one person caught a shark. You know, and you think about that, it's a chum slick. You're talking, and they, these guys are using rays, bonitas, they're using every bait thing, every uh, different species of bait you can imagine. And they're not, they caught nothing. So it really doesn't do anything. It's all about if the sharks are there, like if they're highly concentrated. If the sharks are feeding on jack pavals that are a mile down the beach, and you have stingrays and bonitas out, they're not gonna touch that. They're gonna stay with their food source. So 
if you've if you've tried doing it, uh, and and also it doesn't look good, guys. Don't make when you drop block of chum around where people are swimming. People get people get offended about that. Um, and bring to my next point: always avoid fishing near guarded beaches. Just there might be a great fishing spot. Just 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 don't do it when people are swimming there. You know, uh, in Florida right now, this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm stopping the tournament. Land-based shark fishing is under attack. That's why you don't see me posting a lot of land-based shark fishing videos right now. Is because they're trying to ban it. There's a, there's a big movement trying to get rid of it, and you know we have to be responsible anglers. We have to fish responsibly. We got to clean up. We got to make sure that they can't make any excuses why uh, we, you know they can't make excuse against shark fishermen or against fishermen in general. You want to make sure that you always fish outside of a guarded beach area. I don't know if you guys have the same thing up here where a lifeguard's on duty and then there's a sign that says end of guarded beach. You always want to fish outside of that. You know, and the lifeguard's not there at night. You can fish there all night long if you want. So um, just make sure that you guys really just m be mindful of those people because I don't want, this is, a, this, is a, uh, this is the only way for people that don't have a boat or people that want to really have a challenge to pursue a really big fish from the beach and you don't want to see that, those privileges get taken away. You know, that's something you want to keep for your children's children. Uh, now we're gonna talk about a little bit about offshore shark fishing. Um, and obviously this is, this varies based on where you are, but the first thing we're gonna talk about is the gear, right? So, and this gets a little more technical than, than the beach. So your gear depends on the size of the shark you're targeting and the depth of your water. So for example, if I'm in the Bahamas and I'm fishing on the flats, well, the drop, the, it drops off to 1,000 feet within, you know, 50 yards, right? So there's these giant 15-foot tigers that hang on the flats there. If you hook one, he's going to take you, he's heading to that deep water. That's his refuge. So if you're fishing a, a light tackle reel, like a 50 wide, and you get a 1,000-pound shark that takes you down over 1,000 feet, you're never going to get that fish to the boat. You're, you're never. You're fishing, you're not just fighting the fish anymore. You're fighting all that water weight that that fish is. And if he turns on his side, you just can't move it. You need... When I fish really deep water, I, I only fish a 130, you know, because it has so much more winching power than a, you know, and er every turn you're gaining so much more line, you know, so that's what you really got to take into consideration. And you got to make sure you have the right drag. You know, if you're fishing shallow water, like in the Keys or, you know, in the flats back here, maybe, like you guys don't have the problem we have in Florida where it drops off a thousand feet within 10 miles. So if you hook a shark in 100 feet of water here, you can, you can catch a thousand pound fish on, on a 30 wide, you know, because he can't spool you. You can just chase him down with the boat. But if you go to the canyons out here or you go to deep water and, and you hook a 1,000-pound fish and he dives yeah. and he gets into an, an, an underwater current, that, you know, and you have all that line, that scope, you're, you know, you, when, you, when you have a fish take you down that far you're from the beach or from the, the boat, all that line, you're fighting, that, that creates its own pressure too. You know, it's, it, and there's different currents at different depths. You know, so you might be fighting current and fish and water weight and everything all at the same time. So... You definitely want to make sure you, you have the right tackle for the certain depth of fishing. Um, and, you know, you just want to, like in the Keys, for example, I, 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 I caught a 500-pound hammerhead on an 80 wide, right? And, I, and after I did, I was like, you know what? I could have I done that on a, on a spinning rod almost, basically, because it's only 15 feet deep. You know, you could have, you just fall with the boat until you get tired, right? But, you know, at the same time, you don't want to do that because you, you don't want to fight them for too long. So finding sharks offshore, um, this can actually pretty, be pretty challenging. Sometimes... You're in that one spot you've gone to for a long time. You're like, oh, they're always here, and you go there, and they're not there, right? So sharks are always moving, always. Like, like people in Florida think that we have bull sharks all the time. Our bull sharks are all mi migratory fish. In the wintertime, they're all gone. You know, in the springtime right now, they all came back. You know, and I don't, really, I don't even know where they go. No, no one really has tracked them much. They, they move all, all through the Caribbean and that, in the Bahamas. But when they, when they come, they like to hang around certain structure, like, ledges, you know, reefs, um, you would be surprised if, you know, if you find a good rip offshore, you know, you could find a whole bunch of sharks in that rip. I mean, I've, I've seen it, you know, w when we're fishing for sailfish, sargasm, floating debris, you know, if you guys, if you guys, if you guys can find something that came up through the Gulf Stream and it has a whole bunch of little fish on it, there's probably a good chance there's a, a big shark within two or three mile radius that's staying around because that's a good food source. When you go into the deep water, they're the pelagic fish. Those fish, and they have a rough life. They really do. They, they can go days without eating. So when they find a good food source, they're going to stick with it. You know, if in, you look at like a mahi, for example, those things, I mean, you can, when they're really hungry, you can throw your flip-flop on a hook and they'll eat it. 
It, it doesn't matter. We, we've actually, the drift boats in Florida have filleted them and pulled flip flops and all kinds of weird stuff out of their stomachs. So don't be surprised what they're going to eat. Uh, in Australia, um, for blue marlin and black marlin, they, they forget the names of the guys that did it. They were trolling rubber chickens and they were hooking granders on the rubber chickens. You know, so w when these fish are hungry, they'll eat almost pretty much anything. But, you know, that's the thing, you've got to find where they're hanging out. And they'll hang around, most of the time, they're going to hang around a good food source. Um, like, for example, in Florida right now, we have uh, the Bonita, our, our false albacore, start showing up. And this is when, right now, if you go offshore, you're going to catch bull sharks mostly, and you might, you might catch a sandbar. But when the Bonita show up with false albacore, we get duskies, silkies, reef sharks. We get, we get like seven, eight different species of sharks that follow them follow that bait food source. So I don't know what it's like out here with your tuna fishery and that, but I imagine when those tuna show up, if you want to catch big makos, just, just find the tuna. You know, if you're, if you, if you're um, you know, you can set up a chum slick and you can chum in the open ocean. I've done this for all day long. And you'll never see a single shark, you know? And the same thing in Florida. I mean, you think like, I'm only four miles off the beach, man. Come on, there's gotta be a shark here somewhere, right? No, it is. You can go all day and not see one. You know, you want to find, and once you start marking some bait, you know, if the fish are down 500 feet, it don't matter. There's bait there. Those sharks will come up if you start creating enough uh, attraction for them. One thing I like doing a lot, you know, and we're going to the chumming right now, um, having a good chum slick is, is super important, right? So, like, I always like to mix things up. One thing I like to do is, is just try to get a food chain reaction going. So, I like to use little glass minnows or little, little bait fish you know, frozen, whatever, and I like to get, I try to get little fish come, come to my boat. Because if you can get the little fish feeding, you know, whatever they are, then that gets the sharks to go, what's going on up there? What is it, what's all that commotion? They're gonna come up and check it out. They're, they're very curious fish. Um, and one thing I like to do is I like to like, get a lot of little chunks of like false albacore or other fish, and you wanna have it like just float down. So it looks like, hey, there's a, something's feeding up there. You know, when you have little debris, like of chunks of meat floating down in the depths, if a shark's down 800 feet and he starts finding those little debris pieces, he's gonna follow that all the way up because he's gonna think, oh man, there's, there's, a food, there's, a, there's a feeding frenzy going on out there. And it's just you having some bonitas out there or tuna. But that really gets their attention. And, um, and having, uh, like, like if you wanna, like, uh, like in Florida, I keep a false albacore on my stringer or two or three of them, always. And, and actually, I, I rarely ever use my Hayden chum or any of that stuff. I never ever use that stuff. I always think, hey, the fish is going to be the best chum, you know. And, and, a, and like one fall, like a 15 pound false albacore will last five hours of just continual blood and chum. So they, they work really, really well. Um, and from the beach, obviously, you know, don't, don't do it. But um, so now, guys, we're going to go and talk. Actually, well, before I get to the, the heavy drag thing, I want to ask if there's any questions about shark fishing. I do. Um, <coughs> great question, guys. So I'm, I'm just going to re, I'm going to re, re say your question for the, for the camera. So he asked about what do I, what do I prefer, mono or braid? Um, when it comes to catching big fish, I like to give this analogy. Uh, you know those fitness bands that are just you know just based on your tension. That's what your monofilament is to a fish. You know, braid is just there's no stretch, right? So it's just it's just a straight up tug of war. When you have mono, because of its stretch, it's like it, it, it works against the fish. So I always like to have, I always use braid for my backing. I never like to, I, I prefer never to have my braid in the water, if possible. If, if you're fishing deep water, it's gonna go in no matter what, but I prefer to always have mono in at all times. You know, because you never know, like, like a little mackerel might swim by and bite your, you know, he might have his mouth open, he might hit your braid, and you, just, you lost him, fish is gone. You know, at least if he hits that mono, it has forgiveness, you know, you can, you know, it can take it can take a beating. It can get, you know, if you get braid, if you have a, a huge shark and he freaks out, and you got him inside the boat, and he wraps, he goes underneath the boat, and that braid hits the bottom of your boat, and you got barnacles or you got something on there, gone instantly. You know, that if you have mono, it has, it, it, it can it can withstand that. And one thing, guys, I'm gonna teach you a little secret right now about mono. Um, this took me years to figure this out. So I would I would uh, when I was fishing from the beach, I would hook these huge sharks all the time, and I'd lose them all. I'm like, what the heck's going on here? You know, I lose them for all these different reasons, right? And one reason I found was my line. Mono, back to the stretch thing, can only be stretched so much and so many times before it loses its, its strength. So 
you try it, try it. T t take, I mean, we, we don't have enough room here to try it here, but if you take a scale, you take 130 pound mono, 200 pound mono, and you, and you put as much drag as possible, stretch as much as you can, and then let it go, put the scale on again, it's gonna get weaker every time. You know, and um, after every big fish I catch, or every, every time I use heavy drag, I cut all the mono off, and I put all new line on every single time. Because, you know, I've lost so many huge fish that were that fish of a lifetime because I didn't change. If you don't change your line, that's when it happens. You know, you're gonna lose that big fish. And you think about it, like when you're fishing heavy drag, like, like, like sometimes on the beach we're fishing 80 pounds of drag, you know, on a, on a fish. And like that one video, Giant Shark to Beach the Two Weeks Against Fisherman, sustained 80 pounds of drag during the entire fight. And we went up to 100 pounds and he was still pulling. You know, that, and we were, we were, we were below half spool. So at half spool, that 100 pounds of drag is probably 180 pounds of drag. So, and then you also have, you also have the, the bow of the line in the water. You know, so you wanna make sure, like when I have shark fish and I catch big sharks, I only use 200 pound braid and 200 pound mono. I don't even waste time with 130. 130 will pop every time. And it stretches a lot more. The, 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 lower, the lower strength mono will always stretch more than the higher strength mono. You know, so, um, yeah, I would highly recommend using mono. You know, but have the braid there for peace of mind. Because if you hook a really big fish, he's, and he goes down deep. Line, line capacity, you know, I'm, this is what I'm going to get into right now. Oh, well, actually, let, let me ask this question. What is more important, line capacity or drag, just to catch big fish? What's, what's more important? All right. who, thinks, who thinks line capacity? Who thinks drag? OK, it's, it's, it's drag. And we're going we're gonna to show you right now. Um, I'm going to do a demonstration. So we're going we're gonna to set this reel to 30 pounds of drag. 30 pounds of drag is a lot of drag in a stamp harness, right? I mean, that's, that's hard to hold, right? But to a big fish, I mean, to, to any of you guys right here, you guys can pull 30 pounds of drag for 500 yards, like nothing, just by walking. It's nothing. So do, um, what do we got for volunteer here? OK. <laughs> so I'm going um, to hold the scale. We're going to set it to 30 pounds of drag. Should I put it in my mouth? I would not recommend it. <laughs> so let's set that. Just pull it. So tell, me, tell me when it gets to 30 pounds. Okay, you know what? I'm going to pull it over here. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's set to default right now. Yeah, just pull on it real good. What's that at right there? 20. Okay, let's go a little higher. What's that at now? Pull. pull. 34. Okay, so I'm going to stand right here. I want you to just walk all the way to the end down there. Just just keep walking. You know, yeah, just, just hold the line in your hand. It don't matter. You can just, or you can just like that. Yeah, just keep walking. Is that hard? Are you getting tired yet? No? Keep going. How, how, long, how long could you do that for? You, you could keep going, right? You could, you could run a marathon, right? Absolutely. That's nothing. OK, so let's, 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 let's jack this dra drag up. Let's turn our preset up here. All right, so come back here. Now I'm gonna, we're going to try this with 70 pounds of drag. <laughs> you got anybody bigger in there? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you can, you know, you'll be fine. We're, we're going to bottom out that scale. I don't know. <laughs> this that scale only goes to fifty. It's hard, right? How long can you do that for? <laughs> yeah. So we bottom this thing out. Oh yeah, but you see, like that—that that was a lot more exhausting than than the other one, right? Absolutely. So that's the drag is going to stop your your big fish. It's not going to be. That's why, and you just saw the way, I, I'm gonna show you guys that technique I just used right there, but um, Ben Chancy from, uh, from Chewing This, I fish with him a lot, and he's one of the pioneers of using heavy drag, and he taught me a lot of this stuff, like when you use these big fish, like, like even tuna, like if you, put, if you rail one of these rods on a, a grander, and you put 100 pounds of drag on them, you're gonna crush them. He can't, he can't pull drag that far for that long. You know, they just, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's really hard to do. Same thing with, Big sharks, but the problem with using that, you know, and when you use that much drag, guys, I'm gonna tell you this straight up: you you can't do that alone. You need a spotter. This is the same thing when you use heavy, heavy drag. It's the same as going to the gym and powerlifting or bench pressing. You you have to make sure someone's watching your back because I don't trust these reels. I don't care how good they're made. I don't trust them because you know when you use that much drag and you clip into a harness, 
you're, if that reel fails, locks up, you're gone. I've been pulled in. You've seen my video. So, <laughs> so you know, and, 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 and I, I'll tell you, that, tell you that story. I mean, you know, that was the guy I was with. He wasn't really spotting me. And I didn't have a lot of drag then. I think I had like 70, 80 pounds, which is, you know, a pretty good, good amount of drag. Um, and I lost my footing. I, 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 I brought a Benita in the boat. I, I cut him up, and there was blood on the, on the deck, and I slipped. And I, I fell in. And, when I went, and what, what you didn't see in that video is there were five bull sharks right, right underneath me when I went in circling the boat. So I was in the water with all five bull sharks and half a dozen 500-pound Goliaths. They, and I was, I was being dragged down. And the most amazing thing, I, I, I can't explain this. This makes no sense to me. As I was going down, all of a sudden I started going up. And so it's, it's like someone was lifting me out of the water. It was really weird. Like I said, it's the grace of God. that Because if that had been, if I had gone down further like, and faster, like, like I had a back to drag down extremely slowly. And, and I'm not going to lie. When I was in that water, I've never been so calm in my life. Like I was like totally relaxed. Like I can't explain it, you know. And I just back to drag down very, very slowly and I just swam up. You know, and you don't, and that was Florida water. It was warm water. I don't know what would happen if I got dragged in this water, you know. It's pretty cold up here, so. Um, you don't want that to happen, all right? And, um, you know, one thing that you saw that scale we had right there, that scale goes to 50. I always make sure I check the drag on my reels before I, 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 what I'm, before I decide what I'm going fishing for. Like, if I'm going fishing for big sharks or Goliath groupers, I, I make sure my reels are maxed out and I, and I test them on the scale every time. Because you, like, like, for example, when, when this reel, when I pull this reel out of the box, all the manufacturers do this. This preset knob, it's all the way down. There might, be, there might be 10 pounds of drag on this reel. So don't just think because it's out of the box that you're going to have the right pressure. And if you've ever sent your reel in for repair, the same thing. They always put this down all the way because they don't want pressure on the drag plates. So always make sure you, you, you test your drag. You know? And you never know. You give your reel to your buddy, and he doesn't know what he's doing. He's playing with this and you know, whatever. You think, oh, it's cool. And then you get it back, and it's got 12 pounds of drag on it. You know? So, you know, um, Always make sure you, you test your reels to make sure that they're outputting exactly what you want. And when you're, you have to build a comfort zone with, with, this, with, with using heavy drag. You can't just, I mean, I, I've done it to people and I think it's kind of funny, but I'm, I, I'm there watching them. You know, like I, like I have, um, I had, if you've seen our video with Justin from Lake Fork guy, I just strapped him into an 80 wide and said, there you go, buddy, and just go for it. You know, and you hooked the Goliath and he had 70 pounds of drag and he was, he was hurting, you know, but, I mean, you know, I was there watching. I was making sure nothing would happen. But, you know, if you're doing this on your own, you want to make sure that you really build a comfort zone. And, you know, that, like, like you just saw, like, you want to make sure that, you know, you can use your body weight on the reel. And I'm going to go over this technique right now, actually. So, what's your name again? Dave. What is it? Dave. Dave. So, Dave, I want you to grab this line. And we're going to, so most people, when you're in a fighting plate, like one of these things here, right? I'm not going to put it on, but, you know, Look at how far away the reel is from, from, from my body, right? That's, it's far, right? So, yeah, you can lean back and you can, you can put your weight in it, but if you're on a boat with four to five foot waves and head shakes on a fish, it's not happening, you know? I mean, and if, and if, some, if, if you get turned, the boat gets turned because there's a, there's a gust of wind and then, then you, you go sideways, that, that can pop out. I mean, I've had it happen. Trust me, it's scary, you know? So, so the further the way the reel is from your body, the, less, the, the more you're going to use your arms. You know, obviously, if you're in a stand-up harness, you're going to use your butt muscles and that. But you know, um, if, you're not, if you're not in a full harness, if, if the reel is this far away, you're, you're using your arms. Your arms are the weakest part of your body. Your arms, I don't care. I have a guy coming down for a, a video. He's, he's a monster. He's, uh, he does like, I think he, he's, he deadlifts 900 pounds. He's, he's huge. And I'm going to... I'm going to prove all this, like, you know, with this fighting plate. I'm going to put him on a fighting plate. I'm going to have him fight a Goliath group with 100 pounds of drag. I'm going to see if he can hold it. He won't be able to do it, you know, because it's impossible. Because, because your, arms will, your arms will develop so much lactic acid so fast, they just burn out. So you have to use your body weight. And this is where like, Ben Chanty taught me this technique when, he, when we were fighting the Goliaths. So what I'm, you see how I'm, 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 my, my feet are basically facing, are, are basically, like, parallel to my, my, my rod. And you, you, you're just tucking this underneath your leg, on, on your butt muscle. And as, here, you know, I'm putting put on the scale here. As your, as the drag gets higher, I'm gonna start, I'll start low. You know, you don't, you, you don't need to, uh, we're probably like about 20 pounds drag right now. So like, 
you know, you pull on that, I'm, and I'm resting the rod, I'm, rest, I'm, I'm putting this up against my hip, right? This is, this is for the, this obviously, you don't want to do this on the beach, this is for the boat, and this is where the gunnel is right here. If on the beach, this does not work, don't, don't, don't do it. Boxes. Yeah, no, just, just don't do it. It, it, it's terrible. So, you see I put that vinyl tubing on my videos, on, on, on my rod, I, I, I make sure I can rest the rod on, on, on the boat, right? And I'm, I'm keeping this reel, I'm holding, one hand's always on the handle, other hand's right here, and I'm, I'm pushing the reel up against my hips, right? And I, and, I'm, and, and my, my, my entire hips are aligned with the, basically the rod, right? So you, you, you pull now and like, you know, I, I don't need to put much pressure on it, right? So when, but when he, when he pulls, I'm gonna put full drag right here. Actually, you know what, I, I press that preset, see? I gotta test that preset again. Yeah. So as, as the pressure gets higher, keep going. I have to sit, you see, how, see how I'm sitting deeper and deeper? The more you sit deeper, the more you can hold. If you, if, if, you know, because you, you, at that point, you're using your entire body weight. And I weigh 150 pounds soaking wet, and I can push 120 pounds of drag. And a stand-up harness, I do a cartwheel and be gone. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, I'm gonna put it all the way to full. As I see, see, see it, like, I'm just, I'm sitting deeper, right? Remember, the boat's right here, so like, this part of the rod is gonna, is gonna, is gonna rest on, the, on, that, on that gunnel. And as the drag gets, you can, you can fight. I mean, you can, here, you, you try it, how much you try it? How much you weigh? Uh, 110. 110. You can you can hold this no problem. Here, so I want you to turn, bring this foot this way. Okay, you, you're gonna you want to line your hips with the rod. Okay, now you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna it's just like a squat. You're using your butt muscles, your leg muscles, and your back muscles. So I want you one ha one hand on the on the, there you go. Okay, and as here reel up a little bit. As the drag gets heavier, I want you to sit deeper. Okay, so as he pulls, just just sit, sit deeper, sit deeper. Sit, <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna I want you to sit sit. You, you, so, 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 yeah. So, so, right here, you see how your legs. So, like, you're, you're, you're doing this right here, right? right? So, I want you to make your legs straight. Make them straight. See, you would now, now, you think you could hold that? You know, here, I want you to try doing this here. So, just, 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 just try holding it like that. Yeah, yeah. No, now try it. See, you see what happens? You, you got yanked off your, off your center of gravity. So. By getting low, and that you're, you're, you're allowing your, you're, you're creating your, your, you have so much more balance, right? Like that. You want to keep, keep your knees bent, yeah, and you just want to hold it. Now, is this for a sustained long fight? No, you can't do this. You can't, you, you can't, you can't, you can't, this is for beating fish really fast and hard, using extreme drag. When I, when I fight a big fish, when I fight, like if I hook a big hammer or something huge, and I know it's going to fight for an hour, I put, I put a harness on. And I, I keep the rod in the same spot, but I, but I allow I allow the harness to hold the reel, so I can rest. Because you, you know you can do this for about 20 minutes, and then you're you're, you're done. So you know you you put the harness on. Here, I'll show. I'll put this harness on quickly. So are you changing the drag? I mean, that may be a very pedestrian question, but you're, are you changing the drag depending on the fish? To yeah. Protect you, protect the equipment as well. So if you're depending on the fish and the fight, like you'll, you'll change it up. Exactly, so, so if I'm fishing for this reel, like for example, like, like, like this reel, this is a great reel for pretty much anything. You can catch blue fins, you can catch marlin, you can catch everything. So if I was fishing for marlin, I'd back this down. I wouldn't want more than 20 pounds of drag, maybe 30 at most, you know, because you know, any fish, uh, I forgot to bring this up, any fish that jumps, like a mako, a marlin, any billfish, a black tip, you don't want to use heavy drag on them. Because they're going to jump and break the hook, break the swivels. They're going to something with that much. When they come out of the water and they put torque on that on your leader, something's going to go. It's just I, it, it's guaranteed to happen, you know. So and the, mo the first thing that usually goes is like your hook. Your hook will just bend out. Even like some, even something like this big, you know, 16 0 demon that can catch a huge fish. They'll, I've straightened those out like a needle, you know. They just it just goes because it just there's something has to give. So you want to make sure that you, you know if you, you match your drag, like you said, with your species. So if I'm fishing for Goliath groupers, for example, which is a brutal fight, yep. you know, and they go straight down, they go right, they head straight for structure, you know? So you wanna put as much pressure as possible to stop the fish as fast as possible, right? And, but if I'm fishing for bull sharks, I don't wanna do that at all <laughs> because bull sharks have these extremely violent head shakes and you get yanked overboard. It, it actually, like, I've, I've done it before and your, your, your shoulders, they feel like you got they got ripped out of your socket because you're getting yanked like this the whole the whole time because they're, they're they're trying to move and they can't they're just doing these extremely violent head shakes. Same thing with tuna. 
when they're doing their little death rolls. So you want to, you want to, um, as a tuna, I mean, you know, here's the way I look at it, right? You can use heavy drag. You want to know what it takes. This is something you're going to learn over time, right? For like, example, like, like a, a bull shark, once you hit about 45, 50 pounds of drag, they ain't moving. It's just, it's not happening. But that allows you enough drag so if he starts to go really nuts, he can still pull it. But if you put 100 pounds of drag on a bull shark, you're just asking for trouble. Um, but like something like a mako, I would probably fish a mako 20 pounds of drag. You know, let him jump, let him, go, let him do his crazy, stupid things. And then when he's finished, done, and he, he doesn't want to jump anymore, then put some more pressure on him. You know, and that's where you want to, that's why it's so important to have a, a scale because you want to you set your reel, like say like this is, and it's different, like, like an ivory reel, right? So like, let's say I want to put my lever there. So when I, I know when it hits this, this eyelet right here, it has 20 pounds of drag, okay? And then when I go to strike right here, it has maybe 70 pounds of drag. So, you know, if you, if, if you hook a really big fish and he goes, you're in the canyons out here and he goes 3,000 feet deep or something like that, I don't know how deep it is out there, but I imagine it's deep. Um, you know, you have the drag to stop him if he dies. And, um, but like, like a blue shark, for example, I don't really fight much, so you can probably, you, if you want to have fun, you can probably go 15 pounds of drag, right? I mean, if you, I, I've never fought a blue, blue shark, I don't know. I, I imagine they fight like a nurse shark, they just roll around, right? So if you put a big, you put a lot of drag on him, he's probably, probably just going to sit there and tangle up your leader. Um, so, yeah, you definitely, this is where you want to have multiple rods, multiple reels. Like, I like to have a rod for everything I do. So, like, I have a, my 130, I bring that out in case I see that great white shark, or I see a big mako, or I see something I really want to catch. It's huge. I don't want to, and then I'll, I'll bring my 50, I'll bring one of these out, this, uh, this exact combo, for catching bull sharks and catching duskies and that, because, you know, it's still fun. Catching a bull shark on a 130 is, is not fun. It's just, it's, it's just uh, annoying, actually. But catching them on this, it's, you know, you get, to, you get to feel a little bit of the fight, right? But you always want to bring, because, you, you know, like, I look at it, right? Like, I never used to live in, in, in Florida. I actually used to live in Canada. So when I got to come down there, it was, it was a real treat, right? So I wanted to make the best of my opportunity when I was down there. I, and I didn't want to, when I lost a fish, I may not get a shot to catch that fish again for a whole year or more. So I, I wanted to make sure I was as prepared as possible so I wouldn't fail. And, you know, that's where, that's where it comes to, you want to make sure you have different, you want to have different gear ready for that, that one fish that might swim by that you see. It may not be a shark, it may be a tuna, it may be a marlin, whatever. You want to have something ready at all times to, to target that specific, specific size fish. Um, and like I said, you always want to have your spinning rods because you don't know what, you don't know what, you could go out there right now and you might find something amazing. You might find a whale carcass. Yeah, I mean, you might, who knows, you know, and then that's going to be the best fishing day of your life and you only brought a 50 wide, you know, so... Always make sure you have the, the right tackle for what you're targeting. I have a question. Two questions, actually. Uh-huh. When you were on, I watched a couple of your videos, and especially two videos that you posted out in 2018, and you talked about trying to get a 10-feet. Um, one happens to be like the best mainline, which is the best for taking for reds, and how you fight how about a big issue out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't, the, mo the most important thing when you're fighting a big fish is to stay calm. Don't get nervous. If you get nervous, that's what happened, that, that's what happened in that video. We just went like this, and um, there wasn't, you know, then what happened, what I, what I think, I still don't know to this day why the line broke. That should not have broke, but what I think happened, we went from a low drag to a high drag so fast, I think there was a little loop that created, and it got caught on a guide, and it snapped. I don't, I, don't, I still don't know, but... Uh, you always want to make sure that uh, you don't you stay as calm as possible. And it's hard because you see a huge fish or you hook something that's, you know, if you're, if you're, you're down a third spool and he's still going, you're like, you got to you start hitting the panic button, right? So, you know, you, you got to stay calm. I, I've taken a lot of fish to the knot, and you can stop a lot of fish at the knot. If you, if you, I always make sure I tie a really good knot at the bottom because <laughs> I'll lose all my line to stop that fish. I don't care. You can stop a big fish at the knot. Yeah. There's a video that really sticks out when um, you say, we're getting on a pilot, we're getting on a pilot, and it was a black fish getting followed in the shore yeah. by a hammer. Were you anticipating on I was back out to try to catch that hammer? I had those rods there for that. That hammerhead was hanging around that beach. I saw him every day. Okay. So I was like, I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to burn him there just in case I see him. And I actually had a 25-pound false albacore out there, and he didn't, he didn't want that. 
that that shark would eat only that that shark only wanted to eat black tips. I had a enormous false albacore, fresh as can be. He had, had no interest in that at all. He just wanted to eat a black tip. That's what I say. Like when they key in on one thing, that's all they want. That you can't can't bribe them with anything else. How big do you think that was? That was a fourteen footer. That was that was that was probably twelve hundred pounds. Yeah, I mean, he's eating eighty pound sharks every day. I mean, that's it's a pretty serious fish. Uh huh. I don't recommend land. That's a good question, actually. So, guys, he asked a question about. I'm just talking to the camera here. He asked a question about uh, fishing from a jetty. Now, fishing from a jetty. Here, you know, I'll, let me take that back there. Yeah, you don't need to be standing. So, fishing from a jetty means there's 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 two problems with it. One, your own safety, and two, the safety of the shark. First off, it's very very bad to land sharks on rocks. They die. I've seen it happen, you know, so if you can land a shark on the beach, that's always the best situation. And like, for example, in South Africa, they only fish from rocks. There is no, it's very hard to find a nice beach down there. So sometimes you have to do what you have to do in order to catch fish, you know, but you've got to find the right rocks. Like, for example, when I fish in, I fish out jetties all the time. I, 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 before I even start fishing, I, I, I plan how, how I'm going to land this fish. Right, so I look for a really flat rock. I look for somewhere where I can get down and get ready to land that fish. Uh, and not just sharks, that's everything. If you're going to fish for, eight, uh, if you hook an 80 pound striper, you're not going to jump on some crazy rocks to go grab them. So you've got to make sure that you, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I mean, I mean, that's a huge fish. But like, you know, I mean, saying like you're going to get really excited, but you're, are you willing to risk, risk, lose your life over that, right? I mean, if the current's ripping and you get like, people have died that way, you know? So you've got to make sure you plan, pl you plan your route, basically. And if there is no route, just cut the line when you get the shark in and let them go. Don't even try to bring them up because they're just gonna, they're, most of the time their heart is right, right underneath the pitorfin and if that, if, if that gets hit by a rock, they're done. If, you know, they'll, they'll die really, really fast. And the other thing with landing sharks, guys, um, from the shore, it's very important not to drag the whole shark up when it's a big shark. A little shark, they're, they're fine, but a, a really big shark, they're, they live in a neutral, buoyant environment. So, when you take a, a huge shark that weighs five, six hundred plus pounds, and you put him on dry sand or on wet sand, his organs are getting crushed by his by his body weight. You'll see the you'll see you'll see pictures. I, I, it, it sucks when you see it. The belly's like this outward. That's the organs getting crushed. You know, and those sharks, some of them some of them die. You know, so it's always like best to keep their, their head in the wash. You know, so they're, they're, the 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 waves are flushing underneath their bellies and keeping them pretty much, you know, pretty well. Like, I, I know that, like some beaches out here, like I fished in, uh, in Chatham and it drops off like 15 feet right away. You know, so you could keep the head out, out on the trough and bring the body up. As long as the organs and that are being supported by water, you're, you're, the, the fish is fine. And I like the fact that you said the circle hook versus J hook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've been working with a lot of kids down there, and they're seeing some of these shows where guys are using trailer hooks and able shovel hooks by yourself on the beach. Can you share how dangerous that is for some of these new guys? Yeah, so I'm going to tell you straight up, using, I used to use two hooks all the time because, you know, I never used, like, there's nothing wrong with using two hooks if you're prepared, you know, and, and, and the, the, here, but here's the danger with two hooks, if you use the multiple hook rig. Only one of them is going to stick in the shark. If, there's, if both of them get stuck in the shark's mouth, you're probably not going to catch that fish because they're going to pull each other out. But either two things happen. One, the first hook hits, and then the trailer hook is flinging outside the, the shark's body, which means that if you're trying to grab that shark, that hook is just sitting there. And I, it happened to a friend of mine. He had the hook go all the way through his Achilles tendon and out the other side. And um, he was <coughs> lucky it was a black tip. You know, like if it was ever, an, if I was a nurse shark, a, a nurse shark is a pansy shark, but that's the worst shark ever to land on the beach because they sit there and roll like a crocodile. If that, if that, if that, if that was a nurse shark, he would have lost his, his foot. It would have ripped his, it would have ripped, it would have ripped it all off because it would just would have kept going. So um, that's, I don't, I don't use two hooks anymore ever because, you know, 
that's where you want to use the right size bait. Just <coughs> use a smaller piece of bait, you know, and use a big, a, a good size circle hook. Um, the other thing, using um, you brought up cable, for example. Cable versus cable. Yeah, I never, I, I never ever use cable, guys, ever. Um, I used to use cable until a black tip started biting through 600 pound cable. And I was like, there's no way, if a six, if a 80 pound shark's biting through 600 pound cable, there's no way I'm going to land a grander on, a, on cable. And what happens is. This is how they would do it. This is how old sharks do it. The cable gets stuck between the teeth, okay? And the cable's most of the time is 49 strand. So what happens is when the black, black tips come out of the water and they spin, a lot of people call them spinner sharks, they're not, they're black tips. When they spin, the cable still, they, 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 they clinch their jaw and that cable's stuck in, in a position. And as they spin, the cable is kinking strand by strand and just shreds. And then, you know, not, and not every strand will break, like, like, like you cut it with a thing. It'll break in different sections, and then it just kinks off like wire, and it's gone. Other thing is you hook big sharks that hear that roll, like a, like a big tiger or something that, that's going to roll, or even a mako, if, if he gets that right angle when he jumps, he'll get, he'll get that right angle. And with the amount of torque he generates, the cable just undoes. It just falls apart, and it's gone. So, like, when I target big sharks, I always use two strands of number, of number 19 wire to make sure that... I've never had that ever fail, ever. One strand, I've had it fail many times. Two strands, never. It's hard to tie, but it's almost a guarantee that you're going to get a shark. Turbo hooks or octopus hooks? Like, like what's the difference between Not a fan of octopus hooks. You lose a lot of fish on those. It's, it's, it's pretty much a J-hook that has a little bend at the top. You know? So I, 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 rec I recommend using a, uh, the Billfish Foundation has created great standards for how a circle hook should look. And I would recommend using a Billfish approved hook. You know, using offset circle hooks, um, they work, but you're also going to gut hook more fish with an offset circle versus a non-offset. And you brought up barbs, for example. Like, I'm not going to lie, I don't, I, I never take my barbs off. Um, it does make it harder to remove the hook. Um, oh no, definitely not. Um, but you know, you can take your barbs off too. Uh, one thing that I've had, had happen, I have fish barb with hooks though, and a lot of times when I'm leadering the fish, when you start seeing those crazy head shakes, a lot sometimes the hooks just fall out right there, but. You know, if you're not if you're not fishing tournament, if you're not trying to keep the shark, then hey, it was we call that a Palm Beach release. You know, he, he swam off. <laughs> I, I paid about three hundred dollars and kept swimming off. Too. Oh yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, I was in the Bear Beach this past March. Uh huh. Uh, I went to the state park further up the road. And there were greenbacks everywhere, and mackerel everywhere. I could not get a fish up in the beach without July. Can you? So where's this location at? Uh, I'm at Bear Beach. Where? Oh, Okay, so the Gulf side of Florida, first off, and here's something that we can burn up here actually. Shallow water, if you have a, lar if you have a, if you have a shelf, right? Like the Gulf of Florida gets deep, at, like what, 70 miles out there? So that shelf that is from like five feet to like 100 feet, it's like 60 miles, that holds a lot of bait, right? So the, the longer the shelf is, the more, the more spread out the bait can, can, can get. Right, on the east coast of Florida, for example, the shelf reaches a maximum of 30, 30 miles. You know? And that's why you'll see in places like down like Miami and Fort Lauderdale, there's actually not a lot of bait. That's where like in Miami, you'll find bait in Key Biscayne because it's, 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 it's a longer shelf. So what happens, what might have happened there, you might have found a whole bunch of fish, but five miles away, there might have been a whole bunch more fish because there's so much bait on that that can hold on that shelf. Bait won't, doesn't want to hang out in the open water. They're doomed. They're, you know, uh, those thread fins or mullet or whatever, they can't, you know, they're, they feel a lot safer when they, when they, can, when they can hug bottom or, they, or they, can, they, they can move a long structure, you know, than they, if they're in the open. Like when, during the mullet run, we filmed it for three years now, and those mullet will never go in deep water, ever, because they know they're screwed. They always hug the beach because they know that, you know, they can, they can at least get away. You know, when they get in the open, things can come from all, every angle to get them. So... I've seen days like days like that where you have bait. I've had days where I could pick up sardines and throw them in the air like popcorn, and there's nothing. There's nothing there, you know, just because there might be a whole lot of bait somewhere else, and that's where the sharks are. Like I said, it's highly concentrated, you know. And there's not a lot of sharks out there. People think, oh, there's so many of them, but they're, they're, they're not, you know. When, when these when these guys lose their sharks, just their snappers and their tunas, the sharks, because that's where the sharks are, you know. If they're hooking tuna where there's no sharks, they're never gonna get, they're never gonna get bit off. Any other questions? The shark, mm -hmm. is it able to bait in this river? Don't know. 
Um, I think I really haven't read the regulations in New Jersey. So I, I imagine bluefish are good bait. Um, I don't know if striped bass are, are legal. I, I, I don't think so. But maybe a carcass. I, I, I don't know. See, like in Florida, what, what I do, um, the law states that a fish must become to shore in whole condition. It has to be landed. So what I do when I bring out cobia carcasses, like in, for example, co cobia, you're allowed one per person, right? And I love using cobia carcasses because big sharks love, love eating cobia. Um, I'll take a picture of my cooler before I head out so I have, I have physical proof if I ever get pulled over a game warden. Look, I, I didn't catch these fish and fillet them out here. I brought these with me. And, you know, that's, I don't think there's a law that says you can't use a carcass for bait. Like, you could probably use any, any species you want for bait in terms of a carcass. So I would just have photographic evidence to show that you physically brought that before you went on the boat. Any more questions? When I first started fishing black tips, I lost 19 out of 20 sharks. It just, it, what happened, it, it, you have to, black tips are very hard to catch, you know, because they jump, they charge, they go absolutely insane, you know, and they spin. There's a lot of variables that can, can make you lose that fish. So um, my secret to getting black, the, the secret to getting a, a black tip on is to make sure, one, you have extremely sharp hooks, two, you have a, he gets hooked right away. I like to, my reel, when I have in the sand spike, when I'm waiting for a bite, I probably have 15 pounds of drag on that reel. It, I make sure my pike is extremely deep in the sand. So, because what happens is a lot of sharks, instead of just grabbing with their teeth, they suck in the bait. So when you have a small bait and he sucks it in, and he turns his head, that sort of hooks in the corner of his mouth every time. If you use a heavier drag in the beginning with a small bait, you're gonna hook him every single time. Then all you have to do is keep the line tight. Now, if you're breaking terminal tackle on that, that means you're using too much drag and you gotta back your drag down a little bit. So you, you don't let it, uh, you don't put it on a free run? No way, like no. Some people do, so my, my friends do that, but, but I've, I mean, I tried everything, you know, and the free run thing, what happens is they can run with it and then they spit it. I mean, you might be 20 yards away from your rod, they might run 30 feet and then they spit it. But if you run one inch with a, with a tight drag, that hook's going in the corner of his mouth every time. I'm sorry. Okay, so he's asking about water temperature. Um, this is where, honestly, I've never really observed water temperature as much as being in Florida. Um, I know one thing though, um, water temperature does move fish, but I think if you learn, like I guess I'm talking about the migrations, if you learn the pattern of migrations, that, that the, like every, every year is different, right? So like, for example, like, um, we may have, you may have a warm current come up here or you may have an upwelling that might cool things down. You, something might happen that might push fish away. So you wanna, you wanna learn um, where fish are at certain times of the year, right? Like I don't know what goes off on, on offshore out here in the summer months or versus the winter months. I really don't, I don't fish up here much, but you're probably gonna see more variety of species in the summertime because the water's warmer. So. You know, learning, learning when fish show up, when they don't show up, and, and they're gonna sh it's gonna change based on location. You know, um, some species, like there are local, local fish that like to hang around, and there are fish that are migratory. So you, like I've learned that with, um, with all, not just sharks, snook, tarpon, redfish, everything. They, there's, there's locals, and then there's big pods and big, big schools that are migratory. You know, so if you learn where the fish are always moving to, and you know, being up here, it's, it's, you have a lot more water cover. It's harder probably. You have, what, what, what is it, like 80 miles to the canyon or something like that? You know, that's, that's a lot of water, you know? So I would start off with your, your bait and then find, try to find your predators. Th those makos, like if you're targeting makos out here, they're going to move. They, those things move a lot, you know? And they could be here in the winter. They could be here in the summer. I, I mean, they're going to follow, they're going to follow a food source. Is there food there for them to feed on? Yeah. That's, that's, that's it. The th like, like, like if it was like really cold out and there was a ton of food for them to feed on, they don't care because they're gonna, they're gonna go after that meal. 
You know, the water, water temperature does affect it, but if there's, if there's, if there's a good food source and a, and a t temperature that, that, that wouldn't normally make sense, the sharks are still gonna stay there and eat. You know, obviously you're not gonna find um, a Goliath grouper up here, you know, because they just, they don't come up here. But, you know, um, we see great whites in Florida, right? I mean, that's pretty rare because the water's pretty warm down there, but they come down because they're following food, you know? And the same thing, you see, hammer, you see big hammerheads out, out here. They're, they're more normally in Florida, but they come up because they, they're following food in the Gulf Stream. They're following food up. So wherever the food is, that's where they're gonna be. Any more questions? Down in Florida, what do the grouper usually feed on that like bridges and trees and stuff? Anything you put in the water. Anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, 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 anything. The goliaths, actually a really good bait for goliaths is actually remoras. You know, I use remoras when the sharks are around and I want to catch a goliath because the sharks won't eat them. Go, see, goliath groupers and other big groupers, they have a very, very sad life. 70% of their diet is crabs, sand crabs. They can't, they can't, Contrary to most popular belief that people think they eat snappers and good eating fish, other groupers, they don't. They can't catch them. They eat sand crabs. You'll see footage of Goliaths. They'll, they'll leave the wrecks and they'll go and suck, suck the sand up and just eat crabs all day. And when we catch them, they, they puke up crabs. That's why when you hook a snapper or something, man, imagine if you, if this is the equivalent, imagine if you ate bugs your whole life and someone put a filet mignon in front of, your, in front of you. <laughs> You're going to eat that filet, you know? So. That's what, that's what they're eating. They're eating bugs. They're bug eaters. So when, so when you put a jack of ball or a stingray down there, man, that's, they, don't, they never get to see that. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just have a question real quick. Um, first of all, do you have a preferred way of modeling and defining the color as it is fresh? And when you talk about the need to be taking full color, yeah. um, have you had any luck with any of the commercial brand fish you hook with full color? The, I'll start with that. The, the hooker tools, they work, but there's times when they don't work. There's just times when you get a, when you get a fish that's huge, you know, those tools only work if you can get that right angle. Mm -hmm. If you can't get that angle because the fish isn't cooperating, you know, like I've, seen, I've done it, you, what are you gonna spend? You can't spend 10 minutes trying to get the hook up, you know, because the fish is gonna die. That's where, that's why like, I, I just stopped using them offshore. I use them on the beach all the time. I, I rarely ever use bolt cutters on the beach. The only time I use a bolt cutter on the beach is if I catch a hammerhead. So he's got to get back in the water immediately or he'll die. Um, other than that, you know, on the beach, you have so much room to work with, you can always get the right angle. But on the boat, you get a, you get a really mad mako or bull that's thrashing. There's no way. I mean, you, you, you might get it, but there's a lot of times you might not get it. You know, so and if you're doing catch and release, you just, it's safer to cut it. And going back to mono, um, you know, we've used bull buster for a while now, and I've, I've been very happy with it. I never had it fail. Um, it's good stuff. I mean... You want a mono that, in terms of, like, I like, a, like a, a stretchy, soft mono. You know, you don't want something that's too hard. This is, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a huge secret I'm telling you guys right now. Um, <laughs> me, and, me and Ben talk about this all the time. I'll tell you guys. So when you have hard mono, like, if you ever, if you, has anyone ever ran into this problem? Have you ever tied, tried tying three, 400-pound mono and had it break? You've had that happen? You know why? It kinks like wire. After a certain point, monofilament, because it gets, it gets, it's, it's, there's so much of it and it, it gets hard. When you, when it, when it tightens, it, it just snaps, like, 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 like you're breaking off a, a strand of wire. And that's, that's the knot that does it. I learned this when I fished from Goliath. I'd fish, I had a 400 pound mono on my reel, right? And I'd tie a uni knot and bef before an inch of line came off the reel, it snapped every single time. It's like, why is this snapping? That's where you have to crimp. You always have to crimp Anything above 200 or 150, I always crimp. You know, depending on, I mean, you could tie 200, but it depends on the, on the brand. If it's a hard mono, like fluorocarbon, for example, I ran into this problem with amberjacks recently. What happens with fluorocarbon, if you use heavy fluorocarbon and you're, and you're using extreme drag, it splinters down the middle like this. It just fractures and opens up. It can't handle, it can't handle that much pressure. So that's where, if you're using a lot of drag, you want to use a softer leader material that can absorb more of that shock. Yeah. So you were talking a little bit about, you know, the fish safety and our safety, and I actually ran that a lot. So my question for you would be, if, you know, when I catch my shark and it's laying awake and I want to release it as soon as possible, right, could you give me a few specifics, more specifics on the releasing procedure? What would you advise me if I say, 
Well, I mean, it's very hard to, for me to tell you that right here. I mean, we're, we're in the process of making a video of how to actually do it because it's, it's a lot easier if I have a shark in front of me. But um, you want to pull him up. You, the first thing, the sharks, depending on how green he is and how you know how, how mad he is. You know, if he's thrashing. You're, you know, at the end of the day, your safety is number one. Right. I've been bit by sharks. I had friends bit by sharks. You do not want to be bit by a shark. Right. My friend got bit in his ankle, and it took a 13-hour surgery to put his foot back together. You know, I mean, when you get bit by a shark, you have to you have to go to a plastic surgeon. He has to reconnect everything. So you don't want that. So you want to avoid that at all costs. And at the end of the day, you know, I mean, we're all about conservation here. But your life is way more important. If a shark dies, you, can, you know. The, 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 this is fishing, right? I mean, catch and release, there's no such thing as a 100% mortality rate. You're going to have fish will die. You just, that's just life. So um, you always want to make sure that you put your safety first. And then as a, as a fish, you want to make sure that the fish is controllable, right? If you're, like, 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 like a lot of times, I, won't so, I, I will not solo shark fish, even for black hips, because it's very hard to control them, you know? And a lot of bad things can happen. So it's always fish with a partner. When you have two people, you can always work as a team. One guy holds the, sh the, the shark, the other guy takes, the, takes the, the, the hooking tool, takes the hook out. And that's the best way. You don't, definitely don't want to leave him in the water. You know, if you get a sm smaller shark, you want to pull him up where you can control him. You, the most important thing is you don't want him to swim away. If he can still swim when you're trying to take the hook out, that's when you're going to get bit. Because he can move. If a wave can come up and wash him and wash him right into your leg, you can, if he's got his mouth open, man, you're going to have a bad day. I use a rope for bigger sharks. For little sharks, I just, I just grab around the base of the tail. Um, the, the rope thing, I mean, is, you know, it's a guarantee to get the shark. Um, and for big sharks, you, it's impossible to do it without a rope, you know, but <laughs> you just can't move something that big. Um, but for little sharks, you don't need it, you know. And, and what will actually happen to the little sharks, because they can, they can turn so much, they'll, they'll, they'll tear your rope up, they'll bite your rope. Have you ever had that happen? And then you have like a, like a shark that's in like a U, and you can't, he won't let go of the rope, so you're just dragging him up, and he looks like r ridiculous. You know, that, that, that happens. So you're gonna, if you wanna go through a lot of ropes, I'd recommend using rope all the time. If you, don't, if you wanna make sure you keep your rope nice, you only use it on the big fish. Are they flexible enough to come back? Yeah, they'll the bite your ankle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the small sharks are very dangerous. Yeah. 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 You don't want to. You don't want to play games. You, you never ever take your eye off a shark ever. You always make sure you watch his mouth. Always. You, I've taken my eye off for one second and they got me. Don't. You can ne never underestimate them. So, I use anywhere between. Uh, you can see this in our combos and tackle direct. I use anywhere between 11 and 13 foot for surf casting. Now, the more important thing is rod length is your the lure weight of the rod. All the rods we put in the combos on tackle direct, those are all rods that can cast a six ounce pyramid sinker and I don't know, a pretty decent sized piece of bait. If your rod isn't, like, like, like some of these rods, like say if it's rated for three to six ounce lures, you will eventually snap that rod. You need something that, that can throw, a min I'd say a minimum of eight ounces, you know, maximum, and I prefer something that can throw 10. You know, it's just, um, and the length depends, you know, like, I mean, I believe there's a point, there's a reason why surf rods aren't 20 feet long. There's a point where the, the length of your rod doesn't matter anymore. It, it, you're the, the way you cast, how tall you are, will determine how well you use a rod. Like, you may be able to cast a 12-foot rod better than I can cast a 12-foot rod because you might be taller than me. You know, it all, like, you get a guy that, like, there's a, I was actually reading an article. Has anyone, anyone here ever heard of the guy, Big Kenny? Striped bass guy? You've heard of him? Pardon me? He twice, yeah, he just he just recently died, but he was yeah. he was six foot four, four hundred forty pounds. This guy could throw a mile, you know. I mean, you know, he could probably throw whip a fourteen foot rod, you know. So, um, you know, I found that I can cast a thirteen foot rod. I mean, eleven foot rod almost as good as I can cast a thirteen foot rod. So, 
It's all how well the lo rod loads based on how you cast. Yeah, that's, that, that's perfect. You might, you, you might, you know, I use a 13 foot rod. Um, and I'm five foot nine, 150 pounds, right? I'm a little guy. Um, but I also use 11 foot rods and 12 foot rods. You know, um, the 13 foot rod, so here, here, here's where I, I use my 13 foot rod. If I need to get, sometimes, sometimes you just can't reach the fish. You know, you need to have that extra 20 feet you're gonna get a bite, and that's where having that 13 foot rod is gonna make a difference. It takes practice, it takes practice. I mean, you know, and, but you know, maybe having a shorter rod, 11 foot or 12 foot or something that you can throw better for, cause like, I'm not gonna lie, I, would, I, I, I enjoy fighting a fish a lot more on an 11 foot rod than I do on a 13 foot rod. The 13 foot rod just, at every, the longer your rod, the more leverage you lose. So when you have a really long rod, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's, you're gonna it's gonna be harder to fight the fish. It's real stiff. Um, it's real stiff? What size weight are you throwing? No, but when you th when you throw a weight, what are you throwing? Yeah, I'd throw a six, you know. And then how long is your leader? Should I mean, you know, th again, this also depends on the cast. Casting is a little bit more technical, so it all depends also wh where the weight is. Like, I always like to have my weight stationary. I don't like some people like sliding weights. I like a stationary weight, and I like my weight a maximum of twenty inches from my bait. I want, the, I want the majority of, of the weight of the rig, you know, below, in, in the lower third of the rig. When I throw, that, like the, the farther the sinker gets away from the bait, it's gonna start spinning, doing helicopter stuff, and you don't want that because you're gonna lose a lot of distance. You wanna make it just go. So you might, it might be the way you're, you're rigging your, 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 uh, your baits. Try just learn, try just throwing a sinker. Just throw a sinker, get used to that, try to figure out, every rod loads, loads differently, you gotta learn how that rod works with you, you know? And once you figure that, once you figure out just with the sinker, you're gonna learn how to throw with, with a rig. So rod adapters in the past century? A century, that's, that's, that's top of the line. I mean, that's a really good rod. So do you just get like a, I don't know, like six foot steel leader and then just put the weight right on the rig? I, I have, we have a video on our YouTube channel that shows how to tie, I mean, that's the exact rig I use. I actually use like an eight foot leader. I use about 18 inches of wire and the rest of it's 500 pound mono. And, um, you don't need a lot of wire if you're using circle hooks, because you know, you, 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 I mean, I'm fishing for sharks five to eight feet. You want enough wire that the wire has to be long enough so it can't, it can, it can stretch across the width of their mouth. If it can't go across the width of their mouth, then they can bite off the mono and you'll lose them. Because you never know if they do that head shake stuff, stuff that that leader material might, that leader might come back and you can grab it. And you, if you can bite it off, you will. I don't. Some people use all wire. The problem with using all wire or all cable is it kinks up and gets damaged a lot easier. You know, mono is a lot more forgiving and it's cheaper too. So if you, uh, I used to use all cable rigs. My, my rigs used to be all ball bearing, owner super modus, they were $17 a piece. And when you, you know, when I started fishing for black tips, there's days when I lose 10 rigs back to back to back to back to back. Oh, there goes $70, that's, that's, that's you know, or it goes to $100, $150. You know, it gets really expensive really fast. So. You know, you want to use cheaper lead materials and you want to make sure that, um, you know, I like the mono because it just, it's a good, sh it's a much better shock absorber than, 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 than all wire. Yeah, you have a question? Um, can you fly fish with black tips? Yes. Will you be making a video on that shortly? Or? I tried this this past year. It's, the, the, I mean, like I said, I only caught 12 the whole year. I usually, I usually catch 100. So um, they are, it's a very finesse shark very finesse, you have to really trick him. There's a guy in Palm Beach um, that is world famous for doing it, his name's Scott Hamilton. I, if you wanna catch one, I'd recommend co contacting Scott Hamilton. He's, that's all he does. Any other questions? John, do we, we got any questions online? Yeah, you, the comments are about random like, <laughs> All right, so we'll answer some online. What size reels would you recommend for catching hammerhead? That 130 right there, that's, that, that's, um, if you want to catch big sharks, anything over 12 foot, I would recommend the 80 wide. Hammerheads, you got to land as fast as possible. You got to use a, a, an insane amount of drag, especially from the beach, and you need to use, um, you need to have a lot of line capacity because, I, I mean, we, we fought one for two and a half hours. It was, what, every bit of 14 feet, and it took us 
I'd say almost an hour and a half to get back from a thousand yards. So it's yeah, you, you need the line and you need the drag. And a 50. That's a 50, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people want to know what's a good aim from the um, combo control. Oh, if you look on the black page one, we've actually that, that beef stick one we have, the Daiwa beef stick, and what's the real, the, the pen? The fierce. The fierce that, that, you can catch sharks on that all day long. My friend, um, he's used that Daiwa beef stick. He's had it since 2004, and he's caught. <laughs> 800 sharks on it, and it's not broken. So it's 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 a for 35 dollars or 40 bucks. It's a pretty darn good rod. Also, someone said they got bitten by a bull shark seven years ago. He took his left leg and four fingers with his left hand. Yeah, that sucks. Was he was he spear fishing? I don't know if he did, but uh, it sure was. <laughs> yeah. My gosh, that would, that would really suck. One thing I want to show you guys actually is our um, if you guys want to catch sharks on lures. This is our this is our beginner pack. You know, I'm actually gonna put this back on the rack here. Sharks on lures are the, is the coolest, most amazing thing ever. And if you can do it, if you can sight fish the sharks on lures, you will stop speaking English like I did. <laughs> so these are the lures I use. Uh, these are in our pro pack. We got a subsurface, you know, in case you know whatever, a, a top water that, that that you know that's moving on top. You can use a, a pop or two, and then something that dives. Like for example, like, like one night, and actually one of our videos we had this. We um, we were shark fishing at night with lures, and I was throwing, I was throwing these, this thing. I couldn't get a bite. Is that orca? This is an orca, yeah. You know, this is a really good lure. They love these things. But I couldn't get a bite. When I switched to the north bar here, it dies, and it was rubbing the sand. Every cast, I was getting, they just were not hitting top water. They were feeding on something that was, I think they were feeding on croakers or, or whiting, and that's, what they, that's all they wanted. So um, you got to have, the, you gotta have the right lures to, um, you know, to, to match what they're feeding on. So, you, you know, this, this is a great range right here, and you can, you can get a big pencil popper or a, a, you know, a big cup popper or whatever, and those work really well, too. Here, do you, John, do you guys want to pass these around? Yeah. Is this the lures off the beach? Pardon me? Is this the lures off the beach? Yeah, it's the coolest thing ever. If you can, if you can do it, trust me, it's, it's, it's the funnest thing ever. In Florida, okay, so, so black tips and lemon sharks are going to be your, your easiest fish to hit on lures. Um, lemon sharks you're going to find, you can probably get them year-round in, in the Keys and in the, and in the, um, the Florida Everglades. Uh, black tips, you've you got to follow the migration. So right now they're, they're probably up in uh, Georgia or uh, South Carolina right now. So those black tips are the best ones to catch on, on top water because they, they explode out of the water, they go crazy. Lemon sharks will hit it too. I, I haven't had much experience with sandbars or stuff up here, your brown sharks and that, so may, they might hit it, you know, but you gotta, you can't just, if, you, if you're planning to just throw a lure and hope, hoping a shark's gonna hit it, not gonna happen. You gotta, one, one thing I use, <coughs> if, you guys, if you guys have ever thought about this, I actually use my drone. I send my drone up and I go look for sharks <laughs> and then when I find them, I, go, I walk over and I start throwing the popper. That's, that's one way you can find them. And, and then you, you, you can actually sight fish to them, you know. Um, that's you got, but you got you got to throw it in front of them. If they don't see it, then they're not going to chase it. Um, what setup would you recommend for uh, cast of uh, for for sharks or for bluefish or that? Um, seven foot rod, and um, you know you don't need a big reel because uh, when you're when you're fishing for sharks from a kayak, I've, I've done a fair amount of it. There's a point where drag doesn't matter anymore, and they just keep towing you around. So, um, you know, you could probably fit use a reel like this Saltigo or like a, a you know an 8,000 pen bow or some of that or conflict, and you know fill it with 50 pound braid, and you'll be good to go. Like yeah, it'd be fine. You know, I mean, as long as it, like the only problem when you when you kayak fish, if you get into deep water, like in Florida, and you hook a big shark, you're screwed. I mean, you're just you're so screwed because you can't you cannot get them off off from the depths. Like I fought a 450 pound bull shark in 38 feet of water and it took me over 20 minutes to get him up 10 feet. If, it's, if, that was, if he went down 100 feet, I'd have to cut the line. There, there'd be no way I'd ever get that fish up. You, just, you don't have the leverage on a kayak to, to lift big fish from deep water. So when you're, when you're thinking of drag, you're thinking of other things, when does time come into the factor? Because you believe in catch and release, which is great. When does, when Two, do you say, like, when do you say, like, depending on the fish, like, 
two and, two and a half, three hours is the max. I'd cut the line after that. Um, yeah, after two hours, the same ha thing happens with marlin and tuna. Tuna will actually cook, cook themselves in from the inside out with lactic acid. Uh, marlin, they just sink deep and die. These fish just can't fight for hours and hours and hours. Um, sometimes tuna can. If there's a good current, that's, if there's something that, that can push water through their gills and it keeps them going, yeah, they can stay alive. But, but if, if you're fighting them and they're just all over the place and they're not getting good water through their gills, they'll, they'll die in two, two and a half, three hours. Um, you gotta, you know what I did? And this is the biggest tip ever. Talk to scuba divers. Scuba divers know more about the ocean than anyone in this room. You know, they know everything. They know where everything is. Like, I'm still trying to find, uh, down by me, there's this enormous school of migratory jackalvals that average 40 to 50 pounds, and they hang out in the deep water. And I'm still trying to find them. I haven't, I haven't never found them yet. The divers see them every day. So I, I, I but divers, this is where uh, I'm gonna pull a little Kevin Mitnick right here. You gotta use a little bit of social engineering. You gotta pretend you're a diver. You gotta go to them and say, hey, I'm looking to find, I I'm, I'm, I'm just came down and I'm, I'm looking, I really wanna dive with a Goliath grouper. Where should I go? And then they'll tell you, and then you go fishing. I, I, honestly, the best way to get, if you want to get fresh bait, go on a drift boat. Drift boats catch so much fish and you can get so much bait from them. And they, and they have carcasses you can use, they, can, they got everything. That's, and, and they're cheap, they're 45, 50 bucks for a half day. So, you know, if you buy bonitas in a store, you're gonna pay 15, 20 bucks a fish. You could, you could go on a drift boat and get a lot more, lot more, lot more bait, you know, for a lot less money. Yes, it is. Um, sharks don't like really hot weather, so th I, I find they go into deeper water then. But at the same time, if there's bait, they're gonna feed. You know, it could be 150 degrees if there's bait, and the, and and the you know, they'll, they'll, they'll eat. You know, obviously that's extreme. But um, I find my best times to catch sharks and almost I mean all fish is, you know, the first couple hours in the morning, and then uh, like three or four o'clock in the afternoon till dark. You know, that 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 time between 9 a.m. and like Three, three o'clock is like dead time. I actually, I don't even fish anymore during that time. I just stopped fishing from the beach. I only fish when, I, like tide doesn't even mean anything to me because it doesn't matter if high tide's in the, in, at noon. Sharks, they don't feed. And tide is a factor for them? Or it is food? depending on the structure you're fishing. If you're fishing a beach that's pretty deep, it doesn't really, doesn't really mean anything. It also means if the tide moves the bait out, then they're gonna follow the tide. It, it all, it's all relative to where the food it's is. The yeah, it's all, it really is all about the bait. Depends on how deep the water is, and it depends on how, like if you're fishing a if you're if the, the bottom's all coral, you don't want to throw a cast net because you're one of the cast net. So you got to you know cast nets is much more efficient. But the other problem with cast nets is you kill bait with them. You take the slime off of them, and they can they get damaged. Where a sabiki rig, you can use a dehooking tool to drop them live when you never even touch them. So it depends on what your uh, what your goals are. If you if you're looking to get a bunch of chummers to throw out there. Cast net all day long, but also, you know, like I said, if there's rocks and that, probably not a good idea. Um, I was building up some more artistic power from that, but uh, Sarah and Blaine just let you know that my fish and salmon were a very weaker size. They are. I did not get a chance to fish there, but down south in Minnesota and that gorilla island, I have not had that problem. It, it depends on the, on the area. It, it's. Like when, did you snell circle them? Yep. I snell them to like number nine, number seven wire, real light. They're, it's unbelievable. Like I, my experience this year, black tips, when to get them to hit on a lure is harder than to get a snook in the middle of the day to hit on a lure. That's how hard they are. And during the, what I like, uh, the, 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 um, the more light there is, I've learned that the, you have to use a much small, the smaller the lure you have to use. You have to use something this big to get a bite. They won't hit big plugs. It's crazy, and you gotta use light wire. Like I was throwing plugs this big, like 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 the like, like the ones you guys pass around, and when they w within 20 feet of the shark, they they take off in the opposite direction. They, they were scared of it. They knew it. They were they'd spook within 30 feet. So, so you got a leader down. That's where a fly guy can have a huge advantage over a, a you know guy that's throwing a popper. You know you want to use little X wraps, little whatever, l something very small that looks like a like like, like a simple meal. I, 
I actually don't use circle hooks on lures. The pro I, I found this problem out when I was fishing for tarpon. What happens is when the fish hit it, they break the circle hook inward. If they, if they, if they clamp down on it, they, they, they snap the tip off. That's how I had it happen. So I use, I use a, we got them on the website, right? The, the recommended hooks on the, the lure combos. Yeah, I use, I use, a, I use a stainless steel Mustad uh, J hook. You know, and the thing is, you're not gonna, they're not gonna, it's very hard to gut hook a lure because this, you, you already have your drag set, everything set, and when he hits that lure, he's, he's hooked. So you set the hook right away. So you're, you're gonna, most of the time you're gonna get him right somewhere in the mouth. Oh, those are good reels too. I do, yeah. I mean, they're good reels. The only thing I don't like about them is the, um, you know, first off, the service is extremely hard to get. You know, same thing with, with, with the duels and the, and the other like, like Italian reels. They're just they're hard to service. You know, you can't just walk into a tackle shop and drop your 130 off and go, hey, can you fix this for in a week or two weeks? So that's, that's a big problem. But they're well built. Um, I noticed the Everall, like the 12 O's. They don't have a lot of drag. The 18 and 20s, they, they're, those are monsters. I mean, they have a huge amount of drag and a huge amount of line capacity. So, but here's the other problem. I would never use a reel that big where I fish. But maybe if I need to kayak a bait 600 yards out to get a bite, that's where that reel like that might, might be better than a 130. Yeah, so, all right, everyone watching this, just we're, this is this is the end of this backwards forwards nonsense. So, on a duel, it's a ratchet reel. Reeling forwards is high gear. Reeling backwards is low gear. Don't we're not googans because we reel backwards. It's just it's how the reel works. I see that in the comments all the time. Oh, I can't stand it. I, and I love when people are arrogant and they, they think that they, they just like they think they're the master of fishing. They tell you that you're so stupid. I'm like, dude, do you even know what that reel is? You know. Um, yeah, but that's a really good reel. I've had that. I've, I've been using this reel since 2009. I never broke one. I never serviced one. We, we need to get. We're trying to get back here to tackle direct. They're, the only the only problem with those reels, you can't, I don't even know. Like, if I broke one right now, I wouldn't even know what to do. Like, I don't think there's anywhere in the country I can send it to anymore. I don't yeah, uh, they're in Alabama. They, they, they do there. Yeah, yeah. So I'll send it to John. He'll take care of it for me. Any more comments from there? Or they're, they're probably coming in at 10, 10, 10 per second or something, right? Yeah, you're talking about catfish for bait. For oh, a catfish is, fish? yeah, it's an awesome bait. Catfish are amazing bait. Sail cats and gaff top, I don't know why, but they love them. And another thing, they're also good snook bait too. Snook eat them too. I mean, I don't, they're the worst. You do not want to get stabbed by one of those things. But I'll tell you what, when you, when you, uh, when you throw a catfish out, I've had days where I throw jack and bluefish, no bites. I throw a catfish, I get a bite in 10 seconds. Any size, as long as you can. I mean, obviously, if it's too small, it's too small. But you know, like, like I said, you want to get a piece of bait as big as a closed fist or the size of a credit card. If you can it chunk it, no, no, don't leave it whole. No, no, you want to chunk it. They, they, they have really good. They're really bloody, so sharks love them. Can you flip those on them with like rib tiles too? Or not really? If you're flipping, I wouldn't use catfish. I would use like a ladyfish or you're talking about snook, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'd use a ladyfish, a croaker, a, a pigfish. I would use something that might swim a little better than the current. Catfish is, you know, that, that's, that's something I, I like to present. If you're targeting big snook, big snook are lazy. They don't want, they're like big stripers. They just want to sit there and s let the current put food in their mouth. So we catch a lot of big snook on just cut bait, like a cut mullet head or a cut, you know, that's all they'll eat. You know, a live bait, a lot of times a little snook will eat it before a big snook will. So I would use in that situation if there's a lot of current, I, I would use a, I would use a, like a live mullet or something like that. They they'd smoke that. Someone named Breaking Rod says, "Do you eat your fish sometimes?" I do eat my fish sometimes. We ate some fish last night, actually bluefish. <laughs> <laughs> and how uh, how did that taste, John? The bluefish was delicious, actually. I can't lie. Yeah, I was shocked. And we never bled them or nothing. We just left them there. And it was like, wow. Where'd you catch that bluefish last night on Instagram? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have to pay John to tell that one. I don't know. Jersey. Yes, yeah, yeah, somewhere in the state of New Jersey. No. They're all in the shallows right now, actually, from what I heard. 
Yes, um, but I've actually been, uh, I have a new system. Um, one thing that sucks when you use a rock and you tie it to your rig is if, it, if, the, if the shark grabs your bait, he'll bite it off. So I like to use like a little claw sinker on my, sink, on my weight as well. So if he does bite the rock off, at least it can still hold better than if the bait's just sitting around rolling around. So it's, it, you know, you can, you can attach a small sinker. The reason I don't like the big claw sinkers you see the guys that in Texas use if you hook a small shark, you won't even know he's there. He'll just sit there and die. You know, you're reeling dead sharks all the time. So you want to use something that is strong enough to s hold the current, but isn't too strong where a five-foot shark, you wouldn't even notice it's on the rod. Like, like yeah, or, or lo those, those ha um, homemade giant claw sinker things, whatever, whatever those things are called. Be a responsible angler. Don't fish in guarded beaches, and be a res just be respectful to other beachgoers. And, and and you know what? Right now, um, because shark fishing is under attack, and it really is, fish at night. You know, don't fish in daylight. When I started doing this, we used to fillet black tips on the beach and eat them. If I did that today, I'd be on CNN. I'd be on everywhere, and they'd be called the shark shark butcher of of Florida. <laughs> they, I, 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 you know, but smartphones have changed everything. So. Everyone, everyone is a, is, a, is, a, is a reporter now. So you can't, if you caught a big shark broad day and there's a thousand people around you, you're gonna be in the news. You know, and you're gonna get bring negative press. So fish at night, fish in spots where there aren't a lot of people and be respectful of other people and there shouldn't be any problems. I have uh, Jeffrey Rodriguez says, what is your recommendation? Do you set your drag at full spool or half spool since drag pressure doubles at half spool when you jack it? You wanna, you wanna set your drag to the line that you have on your reel. So if you, ha I only fish 200 pound mono and 200 pound braid. So I've never had that break. And um, if you're fishing 200 pounds of drag, man, you're, you're a hero because um, I don't know anyone that can hold that. You know, um, you gotta be 500 pounds to hold that. So um, yeah, just do it based on your line. I mean, full spool is, you know, realistically, you want it full spool, you want to set it there. High, half spool, when you get, when you get down there, I mean, a lot of things start happening when you have heavy drag and you have that, you have a lot of heat, your drag discs are not smooth anymore, they skip. You also have problems with steam. If you have bad grease in your reel and it, your reel heats up too much, it can heat the grease up enough where it starts steaming and it can slip your drag plates, your drag discs. So a lot of, a lot of things can go wrong when you have that much pressure at, at that low of a spool. Do you have any plans to go fishing in Mexico? Yes, I've been invited twice this year. I haven't been able to make it yet. I got, I was actually supposed to go to a Marlin tournament today or something. Someone invited me to go to Cabo, but I just, you know, I'm here, so it's not happening. Have you caught any mako or pressure fish? I hooked two makos from the beach. I lost them both, and I have not caught a pressure. I, I want to catch one of those big eye threshers. They catch sword fishing. That's like a dream fish of mine. I heard that's the strongest fish ever. Like, um, your average fight time on one of those is three hours. I can't imagine. Are you able to target specific sharks? Like, what he's talking about, like around here, pressures and makos are really key, but you know, I'm not sure if you're sure. Um, in Florida, there are makos out, in, 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 makos and threshers out where the swordfish are in the deep water, but inshore, they come in very rarely. I mean, you're going to see a lot of inshore species, bulls, hammers, tigers, lemons, black tips, uh, silkies, stuff like that. You know, out here, I mean, I've had mako, mako's delicious, but. You know, um, another thing is in Florida, I don't know if they did up here, there's a lot of no-kill shark marinas where you can't, even, you can't bring sharks back anymore. So um, would I, if I caught a small mako and it, I mean, and it died, I would, oh yeah, yeah definitely. I'd, I'd put it on the grill t that night. But if I, if I had the chance to release it, especially because I, I film everything, I'd, I'd probably release it. But if you're eating them, yeah, I'd, you know, I mean, out here you can target them. In Florida, there's not a lot of sharks. Actually, there's very few sharks you can eat. Like black tips, I used to eat them. And then, you know, what happened was they, they were, the meat was inconsistent. Sometimes it was really good. Sometimes it was really bad. And I just, so I was like, there's no point of killing these things because it, it's a toss-up if it's going to be good or bad. So does that, does that answer your question? So I was just saying, because, like, pressures I like to eat. Mm -hmm. The rest of them just don't die. You don't, you don't like eating makos? I don't. I mean... 
learn, so if, if you want to target one shark in particular, learn everything about it. So learn, yeah. like a threshold shark has a long tail, he's got that for a reason. Learn how he feeds, learn what he feeds on, learn, like the shape of their teeth will tell you everything about what they, how they feed and stuff like that. I saw them caught on the threshold, so they, they really you, you, Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll find them. I mean, just, you just gotta learn, like that's where you wanna start asking biologists, start calling your state fisheries, ask them about, you know, what is, what is fresher sharks like? What are, what do they do? You know, they'll answer you because you're you're buying a fishing license. You're paying. You you deserve that right to ask them those questions, and they'll tell you. You just learn as much as you can. Like black tips, I've learned a lot about. You know, like and bull sharks, I've learned. The hammerheads, I've learned. But you know, um, you can you can make good predictions, but it's not an exact science. These these fish are in huge ocean, and they can move wherever they want. So, but I said, if you find the food that they like feeding on, there's a good chance you're going to find fresher sharks. I don't, you know, no one really knows. Um, I've seen black tips. Um, black tips are, uh, we actually have some footage of it. They, they actually surf, like a surfer. They, they get on top of waves and they surf right on top of them and, and they do jumps and spins on the, on the waves. Uh, sharks are pretty intelligent. I think sometimes they just, they just wanna hang out. They just wanna play. You know, I, I mean, if they're finning, maybe, maybe they're coming up to maybe something with water pressure or something. I don't know. I mean, Yeah. They could just be hanging out. They could just be, you know, like, I mean, when, especially, if, I don't know, maybe the sharks were spawning. I don't know. If they're spawning, they, they, might, they might not eat at all. You know, I mean, every shark's different, right? Every, every fish is different. They behave differently based on their environment. So you need to learn. That's where you need to take the time to really learn the behavior of the fish to understand why they're doing things. Like, I finally learned why, like, this year we, we figured out why the black tips jump and spin. You know, for years, scientists have been asked about that. I, I got a video, I haven't sent it to them yet, but I've actually figured it out. It's, there's nothing, people thought it was about parasites, they thought it was about uh, food, it's not, nothing to do with that. It's actually a, like a dance. We, got, we, we were filming the drone, and you can see the, sh the sharks, they're, they, all come up, they, they all come up in sequence, and then one of them will spin and jump on the water. That's why it's always random, because it's always at different spots. So it, it's a mating behavior, and it's a, I think it's a form of communication. You know, so it's, it's interesting. Like, and that's, no other shark does that. You know, so the thresher sharks, what they're doing, I've never seen that, so I really can't tell you what they're doing, but if you look at it, if you observe it long enough, you, you'll, you'll find out why they're doing it. You know, because no matter what, whatever behavior a fish is doing, eventually they have to eat. So when you start finding out what they do in between eating times, then you'll start learning their behavior better. Yeah, and you know what, I mean, every state, you know, what you guys can do if you're all land-based shark fishermen is maybe organize beach state cleanups or a beach cleanup, you know, just, this is the society we live in. Everyone, you know, they jump on bandwagons, you know? I mean, you know, one, one day they love you, the next day they hate you, you know? Like, you pick up, some, you pick up a piece of garbage and now you're the, the hero of the day. So, um, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, just, tr like I said, you said, be, be as respectful as possible and just do things Unfortunately, sometimes we have to be we have to be people pleasers. You know, we have to make the general public happy. So, same thing. Same thing with, with these. Look, look what's happening with these kill tournaments. You know, I mean, there, there are fewer and fewer kill tournaments now than there was in, in the past, and it's just because people don't want to see all these big fish dead anymore. You know, so times are changing. They definitely are. Um, we have to adapt as fishermen and learn how to be how to work within it, w within the new mindsets of people. on the beach. Right on the beach. Yeah, I've actually, I actually don't shark fish at all pretty, pretty much from up here. You know, it's, it's too challenging, you know, like, and there's always a lot of swimmers around piers and that, so it, it's hard to land big sharks there. And um, the other problem with piers is, you know, the, every pier has a different shape. So, like, sometimes it's really hard to get around, like, those, those, the, the pier domes or roofs or whatever. And if you're fighting a big shark, it, you know, you physically can't pass the rod around to work. To, you can't land them from the pier, right? I mean, if you're, if you're bringing a shark up on the pier, you're killing it. So you got to get, you got, if, you, if you don't have a way to get to the beach, it's, it's, it's very hard to catch them. 
Man, how many comments are coming in? Is it insane? Any more questions? I know one common thing against land based shark fishing is that uh, we're attracting sharks to the beach. That's not true at all. Yeah. No way. You know what? Look, look at the black tip shark migration. I use that as an example every time. Thousands, 15,000 sharks come to the beach, and there's not a single angler in sight. I, I was telling her about it not long ago because I was showing her the video yeah. of the drown and all the sharks. Yeah, they don't. Uh, sharks, the beach is a structure that not just sharks, all predatory fish use to ambush prey and hunt. It's a hunting ground. It's no different than going in the woods. And these, most of those people are, are just very ignorant, stupid people that they don't understand how nature works. You know, same thing, like they live in a suburban area and they, they, they see a squirrel, they go crazy, you know? But when you go out into the woods, there's bears, there's all kinds of stuff out there that's, that's dangerous, you know? So, you know, that's, the ocean is just like a forest, you know? You don't know what's out there, you don't know what you can encounter. and they come and go as they please. You know, that's, what, that's how I would say it. Just like, dude, you know, if I, if I set up a camp, am I attracting bears? Are you, does that mean that we should ban all camping? You know? It's just, I mean, will it attract a shark that's in the area? Maybe. But is it going to attract a shark from 10 miles offshore? No way. It's not happening. The way I see it, too, with that is that, I mean, how much bait is an angler going to put out? It all washes back to shore, too. Yeah, it's so mixed, and compared to other countries, bring in, you know, higher schools of fish. No way. I wish it did, though, because then I'd be catching a lot more fish, you know? That'd be awesome. I mean, can you imagine if you could just throw a couple bunker in the water and you'd have striped bass everywhere? Yeah. I mean, that'd be great. That's just basic common sense for you. I know. You know, media, things like that. Common sense isn't very common, though. That's the problem. The general public's pretty, pretty dumb, you know? If, if you're not a fisherman, then... then you know, I've gotten so many negative comments towards me over the years. I just, I, I used to reply to them. I don't anymore. I just, I just let, I just let, let it ride its course. And here's, the, here's what I've come up to the conclusion. These people, most of them live in a, in a city. They don't interact with nature on a daily basis. These are the same people that are anti-gun. Same, those are those, all the same people because they all live in a, in a, in a bubble. Yeah. And, they, and they don't, they don't, they always interact with people. They don't ever interact with nature. And when they, when they, they, they feel like they have to, because they don't see nature that often, they, see, they feel overprotective of it. They have to always make sure that, oh my gosh, we gotta save this, we gotta save that, we gotta save that, because they don't ever get to experience it every day. But when you experience it every day, you know, first off, you learn to appreciate it a lot more and you understand how it works. They don't understand how it works. I think a lot of anglers, too, are typically more um, respectful and understanding of nature than the surface. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, there's a big problem up here. You guys have a seal problem, right? I mean, they need to kill a lot of those seals. They, they do. I don't, I'll tell everyone straight up because it's just it's out of control. But there's a Marine Mammal Protection Act that prohibits that. So eventually, down the road, something has to happen because those seals are there's way too many of them, you know. And there needs there, there's no balance there. So um, exceptions have to be made, and that's where responsible leaders have to come with good facts. Fishermen. Unfortunately, guys, we have to become the scientists now. The scientists, you know, it's like we live in a society now where everyone's competing for attention. You know, like, I've had problems with, with some of the scientists down, down in Florida, you know, that works on these universities. They're, like, anti-fishing. They hate all fishing. And you can't, you know, you can't change their way of thinking because they have a PhD and, and they're the god of everything. So, you know, um, you have to uh, just, you have to, you have to become well, well enough educate yourself to understand how things are working and then you just you take that opportunity to educate people that, that you interact with so when someone comes to you on the beach and they ask what you're doing you, that's a great opportunity for you to educate someone you never know who you're talking to you know you might talk to someone that, that can make a difference so just become very very well informed so you can defend yourself and um, just become w very familiar with the laws like I have I can't tell you how many times I've read the Florida, Florida Constitution and gone back and looked up records of the Supreme Court against fishing and everything. I've looked, I've read it all, and I keep, and I keep archiving in it, because when it comes up, I bring these things up, you know? You have the right to fish and hunt. That is, that has been the right of this country, of this land, since people came here five, six hundred years ago. That's what this, this country was built on fur trading and, and, and fish. This country is built on that. That's your right to do that, and you have to defend that. Yeah, I mean, is there a few more comments there? Yeah, we'll answer a few more. 
I'll keep talking up here until I have to drink some water. I don't, it doesn't matter. It is, it can be, you know, but it, it, it depends on where you are. If you're in the Bahamas, it's going to work awesome. If you're somewhere where there's no grouper, if you, if you bring grouper carcasses up to here, you're not probably going to catch much on them. Someone also said they got a 14 foot shark that grew on a pier. Uh, I've seen it. I've seen videos. I mean, it, it happens. Well, I said bull shark. I there's, no four, there's no such thing as a 14 foot bull shark. <laughs> no such thing. There, there, there are 12 foot Pacific bull sharks in Fiji and the Zambezi bull sharks in South Africa and not, or in the southern part, part of Africa, they do get bigger than our bull sharks, but not 14 feet, no way. The Zambezis will get over 1,000 pounds, and the Pacific ones, they average, like a 600-pound bull shark in Florida is enormous. That's the average size of one in Fiji. Is it illegal to prevent someone from lawful fishing in Florida? If someone... It, this probably happens a lot, probably, probably in all states. If someone prevents you from taking game, fish, or honey, they, that is an arrestable offense, and it's a second-degree second misdemeanor. They go to jail for that. They are, they, it, it, they cannot, no one can prevent you from, 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 from taking game. It's illegal. Check, I don't know if it's illegal in New Jersey. Then, yeah, it's legal. You're, they have no right. I, one time, this is a true story, we, uh, we caught a stingray, and we were going to keep it for shark bait. And this guy came after me with a baseball bat, and he was threatening to hit me in the head. And uh, at the same time, the FWC showed up, and he had his gun ready to draw, and it was, it was real serious. Is that the only way illegal is, is by the ban giving the scope of the Fourth Amendment to be exercised? And do what? I think the only way it's legal is um, if the scope is private property. Yeah, you can't, yeah, if it's, a, I mean, you can't fish on private property. Or, or places where they have, like, like a marina that says no fishing. Like, you know some of these marinas, they make money. Like, have you guys ever heard of Robbie's in the Keys, where they feed tarp? You think they're gonna let you go in there and drop a, a thing down and catch one of those tarp? No way. You know, the much money they make, they make over a million dollars a year selling tarpon food. You know, they're not gonna, those are, that, that's a big business, revenue generating, you know, things. So, some, I don't know if the marinas up here have fish food that they feed fish that, you know, when they're in their carcasses, but, you know, obviously there's private property and stuff like that, you can't, can't do it, you know. So you just the beaches are in Florida, for example. The high, the mean high tide mark for the last 19 years is the high water mark for state that's declared state property. I don't know what it is here, but you need to learn where state property begins and where municipalities end. And if you're you're legally allowed to traverse, go up and down the beach. So you need to learn. You need to learn the, every every state's different. You know, you need to learn all those things everywhere you go because unfortunately fishing is like it's not just Florida it's everywhere like in Alabama all shark fishing is banned statewide in California there's rule there's laws that says you can't dig a hole deep in the six inches you know so you technically couldn't put a sand spike in you know like there's just there's rules everywhere weird rules you got to learn before you go fishing because you know they don't care about it you know I mean obviously if I came up here and I was surf fishing I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd come with the same mindset oh I'm it's just like I'm fishing in Florida you know, but there might be a law here that says I can't do what I do in Florida. So you got to really become familiar with the laws. It sucks, but that's just the, the society we live in now. I have one more we can end on. We can bring it to Dalby. He wants to know what's the biggest fish you have ever caught. Uh, 13 feet, 4 inches, tiger shark in the Bahamas. And um, anywhere between, it was between like 800,000 pounds. What reel did you use? Um, a Kyra 80 wide. And I had... Uh, sh it was filled with, it was straight 200 pound mono. That fish, that, that fish, I fought that fish for about, uh, I'd say close to an hour. That, that was another question for me. What's the longest you've ever caught a fish? Sh almost three hours. Three hours? Yeah. Yeah, trust me, it's, I mean, there's a, there's a point where, there's a point where I, that I've served with myself where you don't feel tired anymore. You just like, you just like numb. You just don't care anymore. You just keep going. <laughs> That's what happens. I don't know. It's, everyone's different. Was that tied off the beach or a boat? No, it was from a boat. Yeah. Uh, it, it's extremely hard to, to land base fish in the Bahamas because it's all coral. There's very few beaches there. Beaches, 
Um, that's what I, I mean, there definitely are places to go there, and the fishing is insane there. But usually in the, in the Caribbean, you're going to find a lot of coral. And if you have like a deep drop off, like that drops off to five, 6,000 feet, and you have, it's all coral, and you hook a big fish, he's going to just dive, cut you off instantly. He's <coughs> not going to land them. What are we doing? You got any, any more? Uh, you, guys, you guys have any more questions before we wrap this up? No? John, any more questions? I, th I prefer from land taking them out if possible. If it's a hammerhead, I always cut it. You know, because a hammerhead, they, they die very easily. So you just gotta, you gotta get them back in the water as fast as possible. Like with a hammerhead, I, honestly, I, wouldn't, I don't think I would take a picture. I just let it go right away because it's better for that thing to live than it, you have seconds. Especially if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's like a 12 plus footer, they're gonna fight. You, you just, a man, a, a man is physically not strong enough to stop those things. They're just so, they fight to the death. They're so strong. So there's nothing you can do to prevent them from dying. You just got to get them back in the water as fast as possible. Um, and the F, the F, um, in Florida, the FWC passed a law that said it's illegal to, to, to harvest hammerheads. And, and, and actually, this is, a, this is a great thing I want to bring up here. There's a big difference between harvesting and catching. And, 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 and this is the same, I think, in, in the whole country. When you're on a boat, when you m remove a fish from the water, like if, you know, like I like, like say something's out of season, like a flounder right, uh, you know, right now, whatever. You're allowed to remove it from the water to photograph for evidence. They, they give fishermen that right. Harvesting means you're physically taking the fish back to the dock. You know, now a protected species like a Goliath grouper or a long, uh, was a long fin, a long, long fin thresher, um, make them sorry. You can't remove those from the water. A protected species that's federally federal protected or state protected cannot be removed from the water in those waters. So. You know, you can catch them still. You can still target them. Like you can, you, you're allowed to, if you hook a great white shark, which is a feder federally protected species, you're allowed to catch it. You just can't remove it from the water and harvest it. That's what the law means. So a lot of people get confused about that. But, you know, it's really important you guys know that because um, like, like on the beach, for example, you know, I bring this up to the FWC all the time. Like, look, there is no safe way to land, to, to, to go in the water, remove the hook from a protected species without endangering your own life. So they've left it, they've made all the laws basically for boats, but the beaches are a gray area and they're left for the discretion of the officer. So if you pull a fish out, and there's a law that says if you, if, if everything is a continual process, like it's a, the, the, and the continual process uh, ends with the release of that fish, it's perfectly legal. But if you like land the fish and they go walk, take a walk and come back five minutes later, yeah, you're going, you're going to give them a ticket, you know? But you know, as long as you're releasing the fish, uh, you know, as fast as possible, there's nothing wrong with that. If it's a, even if it's a protected species, like a Goliath grouper or a lemon shark or a uh, dusky or whatever in, in Florida. And I think, I'm pretty sure it's the same here. I, I don't know. Florida Sharper wants to know, why did you use black tip challenge only for the red challenge? Well, there is, that was the last black tip challenge. There is no more black tip challenge. But the reason I made it all spinning reels is because it's more challenging. And also, I didn't want people catching hammerheads because we had a lot of problems with hammerheads being caught the year before. Good, you guys good, any more? Thank you. All right, John, you wanna wrap it up? Yeah. All right, guys, thanks for watching online and thanks you guys for coming, really appreciate it.